Um, as we begin our uh, planning commission meeting, can I ask you all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Can I have the clerk uh, call the roll, please? Commissioner McGee? Here. Commissioner Dukas? Here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Wessner? Present. Okay, item four, public comments. This is a point in the agenda where uh, uh, the public can speak on any item that is not on the agenda for today. I have a number of speaker cards, but they all appear to be related to the agenda. So moving on to uh, item five, approval of the October 16th, 2014 minutes. Move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. The electronics we're still trying to get used to here. Excuse us. Okay, uh, minutes are accepted. Item six, uh, PL12-0141. Uh, that speaker? Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez, members of the commission. My name is Hai Nguyen and I am the case planner for conditional use permit PL12-0141. Uh, this is for the Lockwood Animal Rescue Center, otherwise known as LARC. Before I begin, I wanted to make sure that your commission has received all the materials pertaining to the, uh, the agenda item today. Um, that includes the staff, re staff report, of course. Um, also, staff received two emails that were addressed in two separate memos uh, dated October 27th and October 29th. They are exhibits number 8 and exhibit number 10. Great. The purpose of the meeting or hearing today is to provide a progress report on the LARC facility uh, related to the following two topics. Topic number one, the permittee's progress on abating the land use and building violations that previously existed on the subject property. And number two, the permittee's progress with regard to satisfying the conditions of approval of CUP PL 12-0141. The permittee is in attendance here. Um, his name is Matthew Simmons. And uh, also, uh, Brian Bray with the Ventura County Animal Services uh, Division is here as well to answer your questions once this presentation concludes. So the project description um, is as follows. On November 14th, 2013, about a year ago today, the permittee was granted CUP PL 12-0141 for the keeping of inherently dangerous animals. And to sort of refresh your memories of the project description, um, uh, a maximum of 60 canidae, uh, which includes wild domestic dogs, non-domestic dogs, crossbreed of dogs, which are basically wolf dogs, wolves, coyotes, um, all that except for big cats were approved. They're also allowed to have a maximum of 10 horses, 12 domestic dogs, and 50 parrots. They're allowed to have a maximum of five employees or volunteers. No visitors or events are allowed within the project site. Also, we approved uh, the construction of a new storage barn, shade structure, and additional pens uh, were approved, but to be constructed. Are 
The CUP expires 10 years from the approval date, um, and I'll go into that um, at a later slide. Just to give you an idea of where this site is, to kind of see, uh, it's kind of hard to see up there, but um, there's the vicinity map, there's a project site, and that's, I'm sorry, that's uh, Lockwood Valley Road right there. The general plan designation is open space. The zoning designation for the site is OS 20 acres, which is open space, 20 acre minimum lot size. Here is an aerial image of the project site. As you can see, um, the project site is surrounded by vacant open space, um, OS 40 and OS 20. Here is an oblique image of the project site, or a bird's eye view. And here is an aerial image of the Los Ranchos community. Um, there is a single family residence located approximately 1,000 feet northeast of the subject property. So about right there. And this is Curtis Trail right here. This is the trail, this is the road that uh, you would take to visit the site. And then along Cur Curtis Trail, appro approximately 2,650 feet away from the subject property around here, that's where the uh, community basically begins. Excuse Here's, me, where is, excuse yes. me, back up a slide. Sure. Where's Lockwood Valley Road? Or is it on the slide? Chair Rodriguez, the it, no. the slide, okay, right there. That's Lockwood Valley Road. This is okay. Adams. And then Curtis Trail is that right there. Okay. Here's the site plan. The darker grade structures were the uh, storage structures that I mentioned in the uh, project description. Uh, they were approved, but they have yet to be constructed. So moving on to the history uh, of the site. Basically, this all started with a code violation, code violation number one, on February 23, 2011, the Ventura County Code Compliance Division opened code violation CV11-0084 for the operation of a wolves slash dog, wolf dog rescue center, i.e. the keeping of inherently dangerous animals without a CUP. On June 18th, 2012, the permittee entered into a compliance agreement with the Code Compliance Division, CA 12-0039. The second code violation was on June 22nd, 2012, and that violation was for the non-permitted installation of a walk-in freezer unit on the subject property. On November 14th, 2013, the Planning Commission conducted a hearing and granted CUP PL 12-0141 to authorize the construction and the use of the LARC facility. On December 4th, 2013, a zoning clearance was issued to legalize a 10-foot high pens slash fences and the relocation of the walk-in freezer to the existing barn related to code violation two. On January 22nd, 20, 27th, 2014, a zoning clearance was issued for construction activities and also for the use inauguration of the Lark facility. On May 20th, 2014, the Building and Safety Division issued a building permit C13-001132, and on October 3rd, 2014, another building permit was issued, C14-000964, and these permits, uh, these building permits abate code violations one and code violations two. 
On October 3rd, 2014, the Code Compliance Division confirmed that the permittee had abated all the violations that were subject of uh, code, com code Violation 1 and 2, and therefore completed the compliance agreement CA 12-0039. Moving on to the conditions of approval. Now, there are about six items that your commission uh, requested. Um, but before I get into that, here is a list of all the what we call prior to conditions, um, conditions that needed to be satisfied. I won't go over all of them, but you can have, but the, uh, the full text is included in the staff report. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I'll give you a moment to read over some of these. Following conditions of approval were added or modified per your Planning Commission's request at the November 14, 2013 hearing. The first one is condition number 51, is to add a condition to require a neighborhood emergency notification system, uh, basically a reverse 911 service. Now I'll go over all of these individually. Condition number 52 is to add a condition to require the snow maintenance of the pens. Condition number 53, add a condition to demonstrate the proof of liability insurance. The next request is to schedule a PC hearing within one year of approval to provide a progress report. So here we are. Condition number two is to maintain a guest book by the applicant. Condition number 10 is to revise the condition to clarify that the CUP will expire in 10 years. So back to condition number 51. This is the neighborhood notification of emergency. So the purpose of this was to ensure that local residents or interested parties are informed of any emergencies related to LARC. And basically what an emergency entails is uh, if there's a fire on site, if there's inclement weather, uh, or if there's an earthquake or something that would cause a full evacuation of the animals and staff of LARC. So this, com this condition is satisfied. Uh, the permittee has prepared a letter that was distributed to residents within 8,000 square feet and all interested parties on October 9th, 2014. The letter requested that any interested parties opt into the reverse 911 service. So in the event of an emergency, the party would be notified. Condition number 52, snow maintenance. Basically to ensure that the pens are clear of snow so it doesn't stack up and the wolves can hop on it and then eventually escape. So this is satisfied. The, permit, the permittee has agreed to conduct ongoing maintenance of the pens such that the animals cannot ex escape the enclosures due to the buildup of snow. Condition number 53, liability insurance. The purpose is to, is to provide a source of liability compensation for bodily injury, including death, physical injury and or property damage caused by any animals kept on, uh, including any that escape from the premises. This condition is satisfied. The permittee has provided the planning division with a copy of the current uh, certificate of li liability insurance with at least $1 million uh, coverage. Condition number 10, time limits. The purpose was to clarify that the CUP will expire in 10 years of the approval date. This is obviously satisfied. The CUP will expire on November 14, 2023. So back up to condition number two, visitors and events prohibited. The purpose of this condition was to ensure that visitors are not allowed on site. Um, public and private events are also not allowed within the project site. 
this condition is satisfied, the permittee has agreed to maintain a guest book throughout the life of the CUP. This is also the subject of the second memo in your staff report. I believe that's Exhibit 10. Um, included in Exhibit 10 is a copy of the guest book pages, there are two, with the addresses and email addresses of each visitor uh, redacted. Excuse me, we have a question. Yes. Commissioner Dukas. I, I see this, uh, this memo that, uh, that says uh, uh, they wanted clarification. It says LARC is not open to the public, but we do allow supporters of the program to visit the staff and animals on specific weekend days. How does that um, marry with this condition uh, that says there shall be no uh, visitors, Commissioner, except I'd for, except for em volunteers and employees. Sure. Commissioner Idukis, um, I'll do my best to answer the question, but I think the permittee is here and he would answer the question a little bit better. But I'll give it a shot. I think I think what I want to know is how um, we've concluded that those conditions have been met when it appears they have not. Well, my understanding is at times when, um, you know, I don't know. I guess um, we'll have Matthew Simmons, the permittee, answer that question, if that's okay with you. No. I would like to know how the staff concluded that this condition has been met when, at first glance, it doesn't to appear to have been met and you're referring specifically excuse me commissioner rodriguez through the chair commissioner i do because you know respect um and you're referring specifically to that uh statement that was posted on the lark website which seemed to indicate that visitors are allowed to and open to the public we actually called mr simmons yesterday to get clarification on that because when i read the website it was confusing too because the description of the facilities leading up to that statement referred to the Lark facilities here in Lockwood Valley. However, Mr. Simmons clarified that actually that statement at the end only applies to his facility, which is located back east. And um, besides that, I mean, we have no information that any member of the public has, uh, you know, attended the site. Mr. Simmons did clarify too that when they receive donations. Um, and the donations are specifically earmarked, for example, for like the purchase of equipment or something like that, where the, do the person who donated the money must go and verify that the monies were actually used for the intended purpose of the donation, that that is who may be allowed on the site. Just once again, just to confirm that, you know, the donations were used for the purpose they were slated for. But it, according to Mr. Simmons and everything we can see, the facility is not open to the public. It's not like somebody could say, hey, I want to take a tour of your facility, call them up and go ahead and attend the site, see the site. Well, I, I believe, I, I refresh my memory by, by watching um, portions of, the, of last hearing. Um, and uh, there was, the purpose of this condition was to reduce the, the traffic on that, uh, on that ill, um, I don't know, standard uh, road. And so that the, the people using that road would be limited to five, either employees or volunteers. So, um, and that there was this strict uh, no, no visitors. So um, it, it has to do with the, you know, the amount of traffic that's going through there. I'm just, um, I'm curious how, you know, I don't want to get into a, a semantics game. Well, they're not a visitor, they're a, you know, because our, our purpose was to, to uh, cut down the, the traffic, the speeding, the, the dust, the danger of, of having um, cars go to the site. So um, basically count, uh, the staff is saying that uh, uh, this condition is met because Mr. Simmons has said this condition has been met. Because I don't see that the support is there in this guest book where it starts on page 139 
you know, this, uh, this is, uh, uh, this doesn't look like a guest book to me that says the name of the person, the date, and the time of arrival, and the time of, of, of leaving, you know, it's just, uh, it's not there. So how did the, the county just, uh, uh, staff has relied on Mr. Simmons' word, is that, is that my understanding? Commissioner Iducus, uh, that is correct. Um, however, we can request that the permittee include more information on the guest book. From when I spoke to him yesterday about the guest book specifically and about the type of visitors on site, it's typically members of organizations and inspecting agencies, um, which Mr. Simmons can further clarify uh, with a few of these entries. But uh, overall, we can request that he uh, maintain a more robust guest book. Yeah, this, uh, this is uh, hardly robust. So, uh, you know, a single page that says page 139 and then a, a, different, uh, a different aspect even. Would you hold your comments until we call you up, okay? Thank you. Commissioner, I do guess I understand. Um, Mr. Simmons has indicated that one of these pages is for 2013 and the other one is 2014. I understand that that's far from robust, but we can make the request to change that. I have a trailing question. Who redacted this, uh, these two pages? Chair Rodriguez. Staff redacted these two pages? Chair Rodriguez, I redacted the addresses and email addresses of the entries. For what purpose? I suppose to to ensure the privacy of the guests. Again, for what purpose? I, I guess just to ensure the privacy of the guests. Um, we asked county council whether or not that would be appropriate yeah, commissioner rodriguez we didn't feel that that information was relevant for this hearing today we do have a, an original if the commission believes that that information is necessary for your decision we can consult county council to see if it's okay to release that information however we felt that it was not relevant to this this hearing today and second yeah it was for exactly that purpose is to protect the privacy of these people this is has been a controversial facility and Mr. Simmons, at least as he indicated to me, he didn't want any sort of retribution uh, exacted towards the people with whom he does business. Well, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, we get a number of documents, petitions, uh, back and forth, pro and con on a variety of issues here, and those, those are usually signed, typically signed by someone which includes their address for or against. And, and this seems to me is what you're saying this thing is here, is uh, people that may or may not be supportive, apparently by, on appearance, they would be somebody who would be supportive of the program in some capacity. Um, I believe I'm there's just a, troubled by the redaction. The, I, I see a significant difference between those two because one is a petition in which somebody is taking a position either pro or con on an item that is before your planning commission. This logbook is just to log who goes to the site for the purposes of condition compliance, which is a totally different matter. It's not as if those people are taking a position on this item before your planning commission today. So. Okay, we'll let that go for now. Mr. Chair. Commissioner uh, Megan. Um, I always thought it was odd there's no visitors, but yet you have a guest book. I'd call it a business appointment book or something, just to clarify that. And you know, I don't even know if we really need addresses. Uh, that may be a requirement, but you know, why are they there? Would be really helpful. Staff. Public notification. This hearing was legally noticed to the Ventura County Star and also the Mountain Enterprise newspaper, which I believe is the local newspaper in that area. We also mailed notification of this hearing to 
all the property owners within 8,000 feet uh, from the project site and also posted this hearing on the planning division's website. How did, how did we come up with 8,000 feet and how many residences or properties are within that circumference? Chair Rodriguez, um, 8,000 feet, um, including all interested parties from the previous hearing, um, includes about 498 male entries. Some of those are actually duplicates, but for the sake of being thorough, the permittee insisted on sending sometimes uh, duplicate notifications to these male entries. As far as 8,000 feet, um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, but that was the same notification uh, radius from the previous okay, planning you. commission hearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The recommended an actions today is to receive and file the progress report for CUP PL 12-0141. This concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. As I mentioned, the permittee, Matthew Simmons, is in attendance. Also, Brian Bray of the Ventura County Animal Services is in attendance for any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you. Questions of staff? Commissioner Dukas. The purpose of a book is that it's it's bound, so you if you tamper with the pages, uh, you know, it it's can be seen. Um, and uh, the, the purpose of the condition was to keep track of you know the traffic on that street because that was the the concern by the neighbors is that there were a lot of people uh you know speeding kicking up dust i don't know uh bothering the peace of of the neighbors so um i i don't so so far i'm not convinced that 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 has um uh, condition has been met so I wonder what we can do well you heard about excuse me Commissioner Chair Commissioner Idugas. Um yeah I mean uh, we definitely will process a permit adjustment to the condition to clarify these additional items that need to be added to the guest book yeah it was not done very well I mean I agree however the terms of the condition did not set forth specifically all the information that should be in there. So what we are going to do is process a permit adjustment once again to the condition to make that a requirement. So. I think it goes to good faith, you know, showing a good faith effort that, that we are not going to have visitors. If somebody comes to the site, they're within the five volunteers or employees or they have some official business uh, that is going to the site. So I, I, you know, I'm just kind of surprised given uh, how how many people were here and how strongly they felt, and the um, the assurances that were made that there wasn't a better good faith effort at this. And I'm t I'm sorry um, that that you're getting in the crossfire because you weren't the planner for this originally. So um, sorry about that. Commissioner Idukas, that is A-OK. -okay. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> has there been any complaints during this year of lots of dust being stirred up on, on the road or any other such thing about uh, folks coming up that road toward the facility? Chair Rodriguez, Commissioner McGee, the only, um, uh, the only time that I was ever contacted about this facility was after the public hearing notice was distributed. Um, staff has not received any complaints um, about the facility, so no. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I have disclosures, please? Uh, Commissioner Maggie? No disclosures. Commissioner Dukas? I just, like I said, I refresh my memory by watching portions of the, of the meeting. That's all. Commissioner Weston. No disclosures. I have no disclosures. I have speaker cards. Uh, the first is the applicant, uh, Matthew Simmons. Uh, good morning, commissioners. 
Um, my name is Matthew Simmons. I live at uh, 15660 Curtis Trail in Lockwood Valley. Uh, and I'm the director of operations for the Lockwood Animal Rescue Center. Um, Commissioner Dukas, um, we will make sure we have a bound book. Um, we'll make sure we have time in and out. And we'll make sure why they're there. And it, I mean, we did a good faith effort, maybe not the best, but we had everyone signing in. There's also a question of like, if the porta potty guy's there, I mean, should we just have everyone do it? And then that way it's just. Because it was confusing. It was like, well, what if they do this and what if they do that? And it gets too confusing. So hey, we can either do everyone or we could just put a camera up and make it pretty easy. Can I respond to your question? Yes, sir. Uh, I think the issue uh, certainly is our comments as far as the redactions had to do the, with those people that appear to be there for non-maintenance purposes. Okay. Is that correct? Well, if... I mean, I, I can go down the list. I, I don't think that's necessary. Okay. I mean, that's my interpretation of what staff just told us. Is it? I, I don't think that's accurate. Like, Mike Lehane's name is on there. He's from the Wolf Dog Rescue Network. He went on a rescue with us. He did a health check on an animal. The first entry on the name is Bobby Brink, who's the president of the American Sanctuary Association, which is one of our accrediting bodies. I mean, a lot of these people, you know, um, Ventura County Animal Services, LA Animal County Services, San Bernardino Animal Services, all these groups we work with, you know, if they relinquish or give up an animal to us, they are bound by law to come out in a year and do a health check and see what that animal is. I try to schedule it for the weekends, which is when we have only one staff person, try to limit car rides, make sure that both my wife and I are there to meet with them. But if Ventura County Animal Services says, hey, I'm coming tomorrow at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're they're coming tomorrow at 2 o'clock. If someone who gave us funding to build an enclosure says, I'm sending out Jenny from my office to look at the project, then Jenny comes out to look at the project. She's not going around interacting with animals, but she might look at the truck or the trailer or the fence or whatever it is that they funded. I mean, that's just the way funding works. I mean, you've got to be open to them looking at what's going on. We're, I don't believe that there was any intent to, to say that you couldn't uh, uh, operate. We just wanted to keep track of the number of visitors because there was a condition that th there wouldn't be any visitors. You would have volunteers, you would have employees numbering five, and then there would be no visitors. So um, the purpose of it was just uh, to, to be able to demonstrate we're complying with our our uh, our condition. So, are you saying now you can't meet that condition? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that we opened a dialogue, and I want to clarify that con condition. I want to meet that condition. Um, we never have more than two or three employees. Most of them carpool together. We limit trips on the road. I mean, we're doing everything we can. I mean, we're a pretty quiet facility. You know, I mean. When I leave the facility, I usually have a trailer in tow, and I run five or six errands before I get back. So even I'm not running up and down the road. So. When you asked earlier about the uh, porta potty guy, right. have him sign in. Okay. And why he's there. Okay. Then there's no questions. No problem. For anybody who comes up. Or the there. electrician or whatever. Yeah. yeah I got it. They're they're visiting the site. They're not visiting the animals. Correct. Basically, for a right. business purposes, some kind. Okay. Um, I also want to clarify about the insurance. The uh, commission asked us to have a, a $1 million policy. I want you to know we have a $2 million policy. Um, I would also like to clarify that, you know, we have done every requirement that, that the county has asked for us. We've been inspected by the county. We um, accepted and agreed to the, um, the, the one-year project follow-up, which, again, is a cost to the nonprofit, and we've fulfilled that cost we've paid our bills monthly to to the plant or to Ann Clayton um, regarding you know a new planner getting warmed up on the project and people getting um, information about the project and we've been financially responsible and we've also been responsible as it pertains to all the codes that have to do with the fences the enclosures the security for the animals um, there have been double entry doors 
on all the enclosures. There's security areas on all the enclosures. And I just want the commission to understand that you know, there's 19 animals there, not 60. There's two parrots, not 50. The reason we put those numbers in there is when we met with the other planner, he said, what is the worst case scenario? If you go on a rescue and there's something crazy going on, what's going on? You know, so, you know, the, there's 19 animals, there's th four house dogs, there's two parrots. Um, and, you know, we've done, done what we can to, you know, not go beyond the bounds of our agreement. Um, I, didn't, I didn't bring a presentation. I mean, I just thought I would answer questions. Does the commission have any other questions at this time? Yeah, give me a breakdown of those 19 animals, two parrots, four dogs. <laughs> it's uh, 19 quote-unquote wolf dogs. Right. Uh, it's three German shepherds. It's one three-legged pit bull slash Rhodesian Ridgeback named Hoplon Cassidy. And it's two parrots, Samantha and her girlfriend, Little Girl. So what do you got against cats? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm allergic to little cats, but not big ones. And my permit says no big ones. So. All, right, all right, all right. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, and five horses. Five horses. Five horses. I always forget about the horses. Next speaker is uh, Lauren. I, I can't pronounce the last name. I apologize. It's my, I'm not sure if it's me or the writing. Probably me. <laughs> Chair uh, Rodriguez, my name is Lauren Lindner. I'm How do you also spell that last name? L-I-N-D-N-E-R. Okay. And I also live at 15660 Curtis Trail, the co-founder of uh, the Lockwood Animal Rescue Center. And I also didn't prepare anything, but I'm certainly available for questions. I do feel that um, we were unclear and probably should have clarified better what needed to be in that um, guest book and who needed to sign that. I, I'm now more, from, more aware that we need to put in like what time people arrive and what time they leave. That was not clear at all to me. I didn't, didn't even think of including that. Um, but certainly the other question is we, the CUP covers 10 and a half, I believe, acres of our property. It's a 20-acre property. So when we, so our house is not part of that. Oh, if, if I have just like cousins and you know personal friends over, what would you like us to do about that? Isn't isn't that quite distinct from the um, from the facility? It's you know all part of the prop, same property, but it's not part of the CUP. The house is not under the CUP. Right. Yeah, the intent was not to have them record guests to their private residence. It was just guests to the facility. So yeah, you're not required to do that. I mean, for yeah, the that would. Reason. That'd be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm no one, no that. one, everyone would object to that. Everyone would object to. That would call for redactions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, and and the time <laughs> in and time out. This doesn't even have a date. These don't even have dates. This is we just. This is worthless. Well, I just thought I thought we needed to have people sign in that they came, but yes, dates certainly <laughs> need to be included then. Lauren and, and why? Yeah, and Lauren, yes, would it be yes, easier chair. for your facility to, to comply with the requirements of the CUP if private visit, visitor society or residents, if everybody logged in and logged out, was logged in and logged out? And that way we can have like maybe even a just a something in the, at the front gate. Uh, date, and time, we, date, time, date, uh, time. Visitor, what slash maintenance person, that you know, we, their purpose and, and what time they left. Excuse me, and what time they, they checked out. We is use that, a we use a practical? time card application for our employees. It's a wireless time card application that they can use from a smartphone. So it might just be easier under that same time card application that we can have someone log in. So like for example, if it's Santana's Plumbing, the reason he's here is to do the porta potties. He'll have a profile, and he can just clock in every time. But if you want it handwritten, that's something else. But we do use an electronic time card application for all of our employees, both at this facility and the other. And we could make entries so that you would have a time date stamp in and out with, with everything, if that's 
better well, for the I, I realize that technology gives us a lot of benefits. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm thinking, a, I guess, ahead of the curve here and wanting to know how staff would would uh, follow up on a potential complaint um, um, if you don't have some sort of written log or something that you can present to, to staff to respond to their inquiry. Um, if we're dealing with electronic type information, how is that recorded? It, it's recorded to an application and it's sent to an email account, so it can be sent to Dan once a month. Okay, thank you. We, we can consider that. <clears throat> or we can try out with whatever the best method would we'll be. Right is, is there no, or, nothing on that but a name and a time? And <clears throat> the, the, when, when you go into the, when we hire an employee or we um, hire an employee, it goes into the system. It's uh, first, last name, their job title, whatever it might be. So for a plumber or for um, Ventura County Animal Services, it would be first and last name, Ventura County Animal Services. Date that they came in, they'd have to log in, and when they log out, they'd have to log out. And it's a simple time card application. Um, does but it translate does, to a, like a word? Yeah, I mean, it can come out to an Excel spreadsheet, but it, you know, that's when they email to you at the end of the month when you do payroll, it gives it to you in a, in a spreadsheet. But if it's better, we'll just write it down. You know, and uh, as long as your volunteers and employees st stay at five and you can comply with this condition, that's not the concern. The concern was this other traffic, these visitors. Right. I understand, um, Mr. Dukas. Okay. So, so the the other issue, though, is that um, we haven't we've been certainly good about taking care of all these other issues, but we are not good at doing websites so much. And that website has not been upgraded for well, a couple of years probably doesn't there's a couple of animals you know there's we, we need to do that we need to upgrade that but even then that was even before the permit because we we really never intended to be open to the public that was not our it was not what we were interested in um we our website says we're not open to the public if you come our gate's going to be locked right and, um, and it also says we do allow supporters of the program to visit the staff and animals on specific weekend days. So um, I guess that could fall under the umbrella of a volunteer. Yeah, or but, the, but, but you understand what the point is. Yes. Anyone who's not a volunteer or an employee, uh, you, don't, you don't have visitors to that facility, period. Un understood. And then about the inherently dangerous, I forgot to comment on that, the inherent inherently dangerous aspect of the permit, you know, just so we refresh everyone's memory, we went to Ventura County, got a kennel license. A kennel the, permit. kennel permit. They then said, after dealing with the front counter and everything else, you can't have a kennel permit without a CUP, therefore you're in violation. And everyone was all up in arms about these are inherently dangerous animals. So we've sent out a mailer to 597 people. Six people responded to the mail. So, I mean, if inherently dangerous is your main concern, whether you love us or, you know, it's a hot project, we gave you the opportunity to sign up to be notified if there's ever a situation on the property, if there's an earthquake, a fire, an animal gets out, whatever it might be, we want to be part of the neighborhood. We got six responses. And with one of those, it was an offer to buy the property. So, I mean, I just want the commission to understand that we went above and beyond and notified everyone. But there wasn't that much community all of a sudden concern. And, and like I said, I mean, we've been working through all these conditions. There are a lot. They were hard. We got them done in a year. And there was never any mention of our project until our mailer went out. So thank you. you you've got a silent majority out there that have chosen not to respond. <laughs> Possibly. But might be impacted. Right, and if, if I you have a, if you have a situation that would sure. alarm would cause alarm. Right, and I'd want to notify them whether they're a silent majority or not, but I, I don't have a way of notifying them. Okay. So put in an air horn. No, I, I was just I was actually going to refer to that the first condition uh, uh, violation that. Um, we really had no idea. Before we went on the rescue, we went to get 
the, the rescue, we went to Alaska and rescued some animals. And we, before we did that, we went to get a kennel permit. Um, and we thought that that was adequate. But of course, it was just, that's when we found out, oh, but they're inherently dangerous. So then you need a CUP. So it was a little bit of a catch-22. But we never, I know a lot of people heard it as we had violations, but we really thought we were doing the right thing by getting the kennel permit. And then we thought, we didn't realize, and I, you know, this is a learning process, that uh, the freezer would be a violation. Because you know, we didn't realize that having a big freezer would, would have been a violation. So you know, we, we would certainly want to work within the, you know, conditions of the county, I just, I mean, we thought we were, so, um, and it was one other thing that you had commented on, and just, just to remind you that these are wolf dogs that are relinquished, we work with the Wolf Dog Rescue Resource um, Organization, these, these are, these, I think every one that we have is, was an owner relinquishment to a shelter that we took out of the shelter, including from Ventura County Shelters, and they're all, I mean, they're canine good citizens, they sit, and they, you know, they, they, eat from your hand and give a paw and that kind of thing. I mean, they're, they're wolf dogs. Um, we have some that are higher, high content, so they, they look very wolfy, but those are usually the ones who want the most belly rubs. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Uh, Steve Martin, followed by Nathan Francis. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Steve Martin, and I live at uh, 14466 Boy Scout Camp Road. And I have a, uh, an exotic animal compound. I have what he'd like to have, lions and tigers and leopards and, and uh, et cetera. And there, I, I think there is a, a need for what he's doing as far as rescuing these, these types of animals. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out is with the uh, California Fish and Game, hybrids are not considered inherently dangerous animals. When they come up to my place, I have wolves and some hybrids, and they don't even want to see those because they're not considered inherently dangerous animals. So I think it's a little bit of a big thing that's put towards him as far as those type of animals when, you know, my animals are inherently dangerous animals. I have big cats, and we've been there 25 years. All my neighbors love me. So <laughs> I don't know what to say. But, uh, you know, I, I can understand there's concerns from both sides. You know, when, especially with stuff that I do, they think, oh, God, you know, you're a, it's an African lion. You're going to take it out. And we take them down into downtown L.A. I just did a job the other night you know, on a Fifth and Spring in downtown L.A. with my lion working loose on, on the streets. Now, when I say working loose, we train them to an electric hotline. I put up poles and I put up two lines, and they know what it is. They've been conditioned since they were little, and we're very controlled on our areas where we work. So it's a whole different type of, of things that I do compared to what he does. He's very low-keyed compared to what I do. So I, I just think that there's a need for that particular thing, and I think maybe everybody should take a little deep breath and, and look at the situation a little closer. Okay, and as far as guests, I don't. I'm not open to the public either, and I, I don't do a guest book. I just don't have people come. They're either there on business, or it's employees of our facility, and uh, and the road into my place. I have a few neighbors on it. I put in the road. I maintain the road, and everybody seems to be happy about that. But that's all I got to say. Unless you want to ask me some questions. Questions? I have, I have one, and that is a clarification. Uh, Boy Scout Camp Road is Fraser Park. Well, it's What's a Fraser Park address? address, but we're actually in Ventura County. Well, I understand that, yeah. but you're in Ventura County, right? But it's a Fraser Park mailing address. It's, it's a Fraser Park mailing. I'm address. I'm trying to yes. fill out the card here. You yes, it yes, off. it is. So, I'm sorry, I forgot to put in Fraser Park. Uh, okay, okay, thank you, uh, Nathan Francis. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. My name is Nathan Francis. I'm the land manager for U.S. Borax Rio Tinto. I represent the property owner to the north, um, which is approximately about 3,000 acres. And I'm just here to, to kind of separate our activities in the, in the area that has been recent. Um, 
We have two abandoned mines in the area on our property of 3,000 acres. The Fraser Mine, which is only a four acre site on that 2,800 acre lot, and then the Columbus Mine, which is a two acre site on another about three to 400 acre site. Um, recently, I've been working on our, addressing our legacy issues. These two mines, we've uh, did some survey work on our property and came up with about 13 legacy mine openings, which are adits and shafts. Some that hadn't been previously addressed, some had been addressed, but had reopened. And so in the last month after Memorial Day, we had a contractor come out with heavy equipment, a dozer and a front end loader and some water trucks uh, coordinated with the US Forest Service to address any emergency fire concerns and wildfire to make sure that that didn't occur during our work. But we have safe, uh, safely addressed those uh, concerns out on our property uh, for the protection of the general public as we found out uh, several of the general public members access our property and trespass uh, to enjoy that property. So we're just basically the activities we've done in the last month is to address our company's liability concerns and so we're open to addressing any questions into our activities. Um, it was uh, gracious for the LARC to let us use their facility because we are landlocked and so our, we've had to go through a, a very rugged terrain and uh, they were gracious enough to let us start at, at their uh, property to enter our property to address those concerns. Questions? Well, I got to ask, did you visit the, the facility? Did I visit the facility? Um, I did visit when we did ah, have the... Wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me clarify why I was visiting. Uh, we did have some uh, questions about our activities, so we were there visiting with the code compliance and the county sheriff to show the activities that uh, the residents had. And so while we were out there, we were showing them, and that was the purpose of our visit. It was to uh, increase the awareness of our activities in the mine closure. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Mark Preston. Good morning, Commissioners. My name's Mar Preston, and I live at 1408 Banff in Pine Mountain Club. I live, um, I spend a great deal of my time in Fraser Park and what we think of as the greater Fraser Mountain communities because I'm coming here as a representative of the SPCA and an affiliated organization, the Anim Fraser Park Animal Rescue Center. I'm very familiar with the operation. I have been to visit once because I wanted to see for our organization before we came out in support exactly what was going on. There were four of us, we carpooled, and uh, we had an, an amazing experience. I wish it were possible for you to visit as well. I've seen the effort the physical work and the expense that's gone into meeting the CUP requirements. And I applaud LARC for the uh, enthusiasm for which they've tried to meet with all the requirements and be good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Michael Lahan. Lahan. Good morning, Commission. Uh, my name is Mike Lahane. I am uh, the uh, Executive Director of the Wolf's Rain, also known as Wolf Dog Rescue Resources, Incorporated. Uh, I have been a uh, advisor and associate and consultant for LARC since before they were LARC. I have uh, nearly 30 years experience working with exotic canids of all kinds. I'm fairly well known in the exotic canid world. Um, I did not bring my wildlife biologist with me this year as I had last year. Uh, she, she's actually my apprentice. But uh, I have occasion to uh, go to LARC from time to time on business. I move uh, foodstuffs. I do uh, consultations with regard to uh, animal phenotyping. Uh, that's where I'm called up there to verify whether an animal is uh, behaviorally and uh, physically what it is we're supposed to be rescuing. Uh, in fact, I am utilized for this purpose by animal control facilities throughout California. 
Uh, most of them know who I am. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, once in a while, I'll be up there for a meeting for any impending rescue operations that we have coming up. In fact, we have one coming up as an addendum to the uh, uh, December 2012 rescue in the near future. And uh, it's best to have these kind of meetings face to face. Even Skype and uh, cell phones just don't quite make it. Uh, that's so, you know, any, any pro details and things can be ironed out face to face so that there's no misunderstanding on what's going to be done. Um, other than that, I would welcome any questions from the Commission to myself. Questions? Commissioner Dukas. So you would follow uh, under the category of a volunteer because you're, you're volunteering to, to, uh, determine whether these dogs are appropriately placed in this type of facility is that correct that is correct i am a volunteer okay so you're not you're not a visitor <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not although i am uh close friends with matt and lauren uh, -huh. uh and on occasion i will visit their house but they are 114 miles from me and uh it's not a trip I like to make very often, and I like to get things done if I'm going to make that trip. So we'll often combine a personal visit with business visit. visit. Uh huh. Um, later on with staff, we're we're going to have to come up with a better a better way to get our arms around that distinction between a, a visitor and a volunteer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ramona. Uh, Malowski. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate the fact that you've let me speak this morning. I have to explain that I have a hearing loss, an unusual hearing loss that prevents me from deciphering the distinction of words and a hearing aid doesn't help, so I haven't heard much of what's gone on this morning. I can understand your voice better than any of them, but uh, <laughs> it's just certain pitches, but um, it's the distinction of words that I can't understand, so if I repeat something, please bear with me, because I have not been able to hear much of what's been going on. But um, My husband and I live just up the road from the facility, Lark, and we have 126 acres adjacent on two sides and quite a ways up the road on Curtis Trail. Uh, my daughter's lot is directly behind where the wolf pens are. And when they brought the wolves in from Alaska, um, the noise was pretty unbearable to that lot. And the... Um, the uh, pens that were put on the cup application by Matthew said, it said those pens were 42, 40 feet back from the property line, the existing pens. When it turned out, we went down and measured and they were less than five feet from the property line. And after he told us that uh, he couldn't move them until he got a, 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 some kind of a clearance, a cup of some kind, uh, in the matter of a couple, three weeks, he did finally move those pens back 40 feet. But that noise from those wolves at that point on that lot makes that lot almost useless. Almost useless. And something that we have been pondering, our neighbors and everything, since the hearing last year, was that the noise test that was taking place on there that day, the day that the noise test took place, they moved a lot of the wolves out of there, and there was only six wolves on the property. And I've never been able to get a, an explanation from anybody as to why this was. That's been a, a point that we've pondered for a long time. Um, I just would like to touch briefly on a couple of items. Number two, I think I could tell by your voice you've been speaking about this, but it says, um, the conditions of approval, which requires, quote, Visitors, as well as public and private events, shall be prohibited within the project site, unquote. And yet I have here a copy of the LARC website that states, quote, LARC is not open to the public, but we do allow supporters to visit the staff and animals on specific weekend days. So I don't understand, uh, and I believe this invitation to visit has been on the website 
at least since he was given the zoning clearance and the use inauguration on January 27th of this year. Now, I don't know if I'm correct. It, 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 was he under the obligation to have a, a record since that time? It's kind of unclear. Um, but this means that he has been in violation of this condition since that time, as far as I can see. Now, I know there's been visitors up there. I don't know when this, when this condition came into play, but I know when we were very friendly early on, he invited us and the whole family and my granddaughters and wanted us to come into the cages to see the animals early, early on. And I don't know if that was in effect at that time or not. Yeah, one, then, of our, one of our friends was bitten, too. Excuse me, sir. Before, okay. The before, only documentation, I, I guess, uh, that uh, Ventura County is requiring is that Matthew keep a guest book. I'm wondering if there's any names in that guest book yet. Or is this new? There is. There is names. I couldn't. Yeah, okay. What? It seems there again, his word is being trusted, when unfortunately it's been proven time and time again that the way he gets what he wants is to say whatever is necessary, whether it's true or not. I don't, I don't make this statement lightly. <laughs> but I know it's hard for me to say things like that, but many examples of these mistruths have been presented in the past at the hearing in November of last year. It appeared in the newspaper articles where something's been said that wasn't true. Even statements that he put on the cup, which were absolutely not true. And I had told him, for an example, that it's surrounded by national forest. I told him early on that wasn't true. I told Ventura County Josiah's the planner before, early on that those there was a mistake on, and, and nobody seems to care. They just seem to disregard it. But it, he still seems to operate in this manner. And I know that there's been many lies told to me personally, to my family members, they all have lots up there, to my neighbors, in fact, he has done great harm to one of our neighbors up there by being untruthful. And he is a veteran also and uh, has battle scars as well. I'm uncomfortable using the word lies, but sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. It's come to my attention that Permittee has expressed a desire to open the facility to the public. Surely this is not being considered. Now I have grandchildren that, you know, they come and spend a lot of time on those lots. And this road goes right through the middle of my property where my grandkids used to ride the little golf carts through and back and forth just from our lot because we live across the road from those lots. So this would be this would be disastrous as far as I'm concerned if this was allowed. But this was the one thing that was supposed to be guaranteed that he was not to have visitors so that we didn't have to worry about traffic going back and forth. But I'm in the process right now of seeking legal advice as to the exact use of that easement to see what can be used and what can't be used. And I would like to know regarding item number one, what is the use inauguration? What does that mean? Does that mean he can bring in 60 wolves now? If so, have the cages for in this item been constructed regarding the fence height, the double entry gates that are supposed to be in place, and the chain link fence around the perimeter? Are these wolves brought in there without that being done? I don't know. I haven't been inside for a long time, so I don't know what's there. But I'm wondering, have these inspections been done during construction? And does the public have access to the findings of these inspections? I know the fence he constructed on my side of the property line uh, long ago. He took the fence down that was there, put up a fence. Now that fence is all over the ground. It's fallen down all over the ground. And regarding item 19 slash 20, contact person, it states that one has uh, been put in place, available on a 24-hour basis. I would like the name and the number of this person and how one would follow up with Ventura County if our complaints fall on if nothing happens, if 
quite complaining about it. I spent five years adhering to all of the rules and regulations that Ventura County set down for me to obtain my subdivision, which is so much less valuable than it was before all this started. And I don't understand why Matthew Simmons and Lauren Lynn are being trusted to carry out the huge responsibility of keeping all these rules and were only to go by their word and, and the regulations to keep the community safe from these inherently dangerous animals. They themselves admit that the animals can be difficult to take care of, and I, I'm an animal lover. I love animals. And I would love to see them taken care of right. But I just don't trust, I'm sorry to say, I don't trust their word. It is very disturbing to all of the immediate neighbors. A lot of neighbors, a lot of people appeared here at this last hearing that were, have never been near Lockwood Valley and who don't live anywhere near the area. And like I said, I'm right up the road. I'm right next to the other one is Wally who has his house up on the hill there, but we're very close. And I'm very concerned about not just the noise, but the, the safety of the children. That... Um, now, I, I understand a written complaint. If I have a written complaint, I have to put it in somewhere else, which I am intending to do. I just would like to say that when I worked in the court system, the judge would say, if a witness is proven to answer falsely to one question, none of his answers should be believed. And in this case, I just wonder, does the truth matter anymore? I've been assured by Ms. Prillhart over the phone that it does. And I certainly hope so. Because another thing that has happened this year, um, um, in, in closing, is that the fire we experienced, we've had a fire this year. And that road, only road out of there, was closed so fast. Now, I know this isn't under your jurisdiction, it's the fire department, but I just want to say that if, if, if he intends to get all these animals, give them, give them shots, get them in cages, and get them in a... a, a vehicle to get them out of there before the, wire, the fire could get through there, it, 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 again, is totally unrealistic. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we have one question. Miss, uh, we have one, I was just one wondering. Question. I'm I was, sorry. I was wondering, did you sign up for the reverse 911 notification? Well, you know, I, have, I haven't only because, well, I didn't because I live in the Valley and they sent it, I mean, I live uh, two places. They sent the letter to the Valley and I didn't get there in time for the 24th. But frankly, I don't trust them to do it. I'm sorry. So, so you're declining to sign up for the re I, reverse 911 notification? It, I, I understood it was too late after the 24th. Is that right? They said the deadline was the 24th and I didn't get it until after the 24th. I'll follow up with that to see if it's too late. I don't believe that it would be too late to be included with okay. that if you have safety concerns. And um, we'll have staff follow up on these other questions about use inauguration and inspections. I'm sorry? We'll have staff follow up with you on these questions okay, that you asked. Okay, I have asked. written down. If you'd like, I'll just leave, the, I'll just leave my questions with you. I have a couple, three copies of them. Can, we, like them? can we get some um, assistance to her? Sure. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. One last... Bring them to her. <clears throat> one last thing before you leave. Uh, since you've mentioned a couple of residences, um, my assumption is that the address you put on this card, Curtis Trail, is in Ventura County? Yes. yes. My, where we live? Curtis yeah. Trail. Yes. Is in yes. Ventura County. It's in Lockwood Valley, which is in... Uh, okay. Venture County. It's that's a weird all, little corner there. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> that's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker card is uh, uh, Stein McEwen. Stan. I'm sorry, Stan. And you also are obviously in Ventura County. Yes, uh, Stan McEwen. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, name is Stan McEwen, and I live on Curtis Trail. Uh, could you bring the slides back up? Is, would that be possible? Uh, a couple of things that would, would help you understand about Ramona, and I've, I've got a question about for hers and, and things, but the slides, go back to the overhead slide that shows 
uh, the, um, the, the intended facility and rough area. Next, uh, the actual slide, the picture slide. Uh, the, there's one that's broader than that. You're talking about the one that, with the that, diet? That, that's, that, that one's a little bit better. And how do I work this pointer? Uh, the little red button on top? Yeah. I, I don't mean to blind anybody. Okay. Uh, okay, back, back to the slide you were just on a second ago. Back, I'm, I'm going to use it. All right, so if, if I may, uh, to help, help Ramona out for a second, uh, Ramona lives right there. That's where her house is, and she owns all of this property all the way over to about here. So she owns this section, this section, this section, and this section. Okay? Last time that we were here, and I'll show you in one of the letters and one of the responses to one of the letters and, and things, her property was not even taken into consideration as who and as being lived on and being livable. If you, there's a, there's a closer slide of this and if I can get it again, right there, there's a building site where the people were planning to build. They canceled their building plans because of the noise produced by this thing, right? Ramona has hundreds of thousands of dollars involved in buying property and subdividing it. <clears throat> and then Michael or Matthew moved in with the wolf dogs, and that means that three generations of that family lost all of their plans as far as having a mountain home or a mountain retreat. It's gone, okay? So that's for Ramona, all right? So uh, back to what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk to you about for a few minutes about the reverse 911. Uh, I'd like to talk to you for a second about a couple responses to letters that were at the last meeting and things that are, are pertinent to what's happening today. And I'd like to talk to you about uh, Ramona and also a little bit about my deed, okay? But first, there's a few things that you guys talked about today as far as visitors and the reason for the redu reduction in, in uh, traffic on the roads. The roads to and from the, the deal uh, from the facility are privately owned and privately maintained roads. They are not public roads. Those roads are deeded to each individual that owns a property between my house and all the way to Adams Trail. So every piece of property between from that point all the way over to there and all the way over to there, that is on private deeded property, easements. All right? When I moved in 20 years ago, I had to go to every single uh, property owner and get written permission to cross their property so that I could get to my house. That was the way it was. Ramona had to do the same thing. I had to sign a deed saying that it was okay for her to cross my property to get to her house. When they moved in, never happened. Okay? But that's why the visitor thing is there because we maintain the roads. In fact, I maintained the Curtis Trail until last year, they came along, and I said, I'm not doing it anymore. I can't afford it. I have a bad back. I'm disabled. And, and they said, I can't ride the tractor for hours on end. I used to be able to do the road once a year. And it was once they moved in, it was four, five, six times a year that I had to maintain the road just so that we could get in, in and out. The road is a flood zone. It is a river bottom. When flash floods come through, that road has to be completely rebuilt. And that's why we asked that we minimize the amount of traffic. And all of a sudden, they went from a public facility to a private facility. And that's when you guys asked for the visitor's book. And to be quite frank with you, everybody that's opposed to this project thought that was a joke and still do. Most of the folks that are headed for that place stop at my house and ask where it is. Okay, I, like I said, I live right there. I'm the last visible residence before you get to theirs. And yes, Grant, you, I'm three-quarters of a mile, roughly, from you guys. And, and things. 
All right. So uh, for, if, one, one last thing for Ramona. There's no way that anybody could live in w any one of her parcels. And he's, I can hear those wolves at my house. It stirs my dogs up every single night, and my dogs wake up and want to fight. So every single night I have to put up with that sound. One of the things in your history, there was a noise complaint that wasn't listed in your history that I filed. And it was disregarded because they said, I live too far away. And they said that when they did their noise test, they said that they could extrapolate the sound of one wolf and find out what 15 would sound like. Well, I'll tell you what, if there's only 19 up there now, I cannot imagine what, 19, what 60 would sound like. Okay, so anyway, reverse 911 ain't going to happen. Everybody I've talked to said absolutely no way. These folks have told so many lies. They've, been, they've done so many different things. We've been in so much trouble with these folks. Nobody, especially me, is going to give them my personal information. All right? Since we got involved with this and they were in, into the Wounded Warrior Projects and into saving animals and all of that, anybody and everybody that was against this project was suddenly non-patriotic towards our soldiers. We didn't care about our soldiers anymore. We've been accused of everything that you can imagine. You cannot imagine the life that I've lived as being accused of being the instigator against this project. And, and I've been told that I'm not, I'm not in support of our soldiers. I'm not in support of animals. I've been accused of going to Alaska Mr. McEwen, could you, Mr. McEwen, could you direct your comments to this yes, commission? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. And I've been pretty liberal this morning with the five-minute public speaking, um, and I would uh, I would caution you that we need to move on to your points. And, and okay, last time we were here, there was no time limit. I apologize. All right. So anyway, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to give him my personal information so he can put it on the website and tell everybody where I live and what my phone number is. Nobody else. When wolves got loose before, and, and he's, he lied about it. He just said that that's not true. When we showed pictures of wolves in people's backyards, and he's, he said, the, the, the commission turned and asked, did you have any loose wolves? No, sir. They believed him. So nobody's going to file a complaint. Nobody's going to sign it for 911. We don't believe it's going to happen. Period. All right? Everything else I have to talk about is... Proof in leading that it is a private road, and you have one section or one piece in here where the, the uh, fire department says that they're going to widen the road. Okay, that's fine. They can widen the road, but it's going to be done at our discretion. It's my private property. We'll widen it to whatever they need to, but Matthew is not going to do that work. All right, that's going to take a, that's going to take a lawyer for him to do the work. And, and court. We're, we're not going to just step aside and allow, allow that to happen. All right? That's what most of my stuff was about. Here's my deed that proves that it is, is a uh, private roads. Here's documentation that says your, the Ventura County Transportation and Ventura County Fire Department, and if you give me time, I can show you that they say that road is adequate as is. Right there. So why are we widening it? Two departments says that it's okay as is. All right, uh, folks. We're, Steve has an excellent facility. He's been above board. He's been honest with everybody that walked along. These folks have broken every rule that there is. They've stomped on every neighbor that they possibly can. You go to their internet site, and I'm the worst person that ever lived. And, and so, no, I'm, I'm going to do anything and everything that I possibly can do to be opposed to this and to stop this project and why you guys opposed to, or approved it in the first place is beyond me. There's three petitions of every single neighborhood, uh, home in that area asking you please don't approve this and that didn't get listed. It's not here. I don't know why, but we submitted the, the, those petitions. They were here at the last meeting and, and we're still doing this. So, anyway, we don't trust them. 
We don't believe he's going to do what he says he's going to do. He hasn't in the past. His track record says that he will not in the future. You guys give him 24 hour notice. We're going to be there in 24 hours to check and see how many wolves you have. All night long, they're hauling wolves out. Okay? Now you can ask him and he's going to say, no, that's not true. And I, I don't really care. Okay? Thank you for allowing me to speak. And uh, I, I hope you'll take this into serious consideration that this guy is not straightforward. What he's telling you is not true. It's not right. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have one other card from a Tony uh, Malosky who doesn't, doesn't ask to speak but merely is in opposition. Um, I have no other speaker cards. Uh, I see someone here from, I think, Animal Control. Um, can I ask you to come up? I'm just curious uh, as it relates to calls for service. Yes. Or complaints. Uh, could you identify yourself, please? My name is Brian Bray. I'm with Ventura County Animal Services. Thank you. Uh, is there any historical information from the animal services perspective on this particular location? Uh, we have, uh, in past years, we have inspected the property uh, to ensure the safety of the animals and the, the establishment of the enclosures is what our main priority is, is going out to make sure that they're they're secure and that the animals are being treated properly and that the proper permits are being obtained. And those issues were done sat to your satisfaction or agency satisfaction? Yes, we are actually currently working with Mr. Simmons to go ahead and do an inspection for this year, but in past years, yes, they have been satisfactory. Are you aware of any uh, uh, complaint responses from animal control to, to that location? Uh, to my knowledge, I have not received any complaints that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing uh, since we have no other speaker cards. Discussion? Um, I'd like to ask uh, staff to respond to the, um, the thing that was said about uh, a uh, noise complaint being disregarded. Yeah, we were surprised about that one too because uh, I asked uh, Mr. Nguyen to see if there was any formal noise complaints that have been filed with us and we're unaware of any. So it may have been that that may have been uh, submitted to somebody informally, but we don't respond to informal complaints. You must file a formal complaint for us to take enforcement actions. Uh, Ms. Amanda Ahrens from the Condition Compliance staff is here and I'm just looking to her to confirm if she received any noise complaints uh, possibly, but w once again we have no record of a formal complaint being filed with us. I have or, someone or, step, I have someone stepping forward at the mic if you would I'm identify Amanda yourself. I'm Amanda Ahrens, I'm with Code Compliance Division and just to follow up to what he was saying, no we have not received any formal um, any written complaints to our code compliance division. Have you received a phone call? Um, I have received inquiries by neighbors as to the status of the CUP process, status of permitting and inspections in regards to the fencing and other aspects that, or other permi permitting that was required to abate the violations. The Are violations you, is, is code enforcement accessible ele electronically? Yes, they can file a complaint online. Is that what you're asking? Uh, that's what I'm asking. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Chair, perhaps the gentleman could clarify with whom he spoke when he made the complaint such that we could follow up on it. But once again, um, this was news to me. Okay. So, so can we get, can we reopen the public hearing and, and Yes, let, let's reopen the public hearing. McEwen, Ms. McEwen, if you want to, if you'd like to step forward for clarification. Regarding uh, the complaints you made. Yes, sir. Uh, I filed it on the Ventura County website. I, I didn't bring the, the document because I copied it. I didn't bring it with me. I didn't think that I would need it. And, and things, but yes, there was a, there was a complaint. And, and things, I, I filed a complaint 
and and things and things for for the noise from the for the animals and there was some other things that was thrown in there as far as road traffic and other stuff but the road but the, the com, was complaint i i can send you or call you with the with the record i don't have it with me and, and it's, but it was done electronically on the ventura county website um i i I think animal animal control part of it. I'm not sure because you, you go on the website and it guides you through to get there and things. So, but I caught, I did copy it and I did file a complaint and I was told that I live that there's a a distance that is too far away to to be a, a complaint. Was that a verbal response or electronic yes, response? Yes, response. And, and so, okay. uh, I, I'll, I'll be more. I'll be more than glad to send that to somebody or email it to you or whatever. Whatever you need, I apologize. I didn't bring it with me. What staff's uh, pleasure? Uh, yes, I encourage Mr. McKeon to send that directly to me, and I will uh, meet up with you after this hearing, give you my contact information, such that right. um, you can send it to me, and I can follow up on that. All right. All right. And, and we were told that we were too far away to, for, you know, to uh, to be of any. To be, be, that according to Ventura County rules, I live too far away to file a noise complaint on the, on an animal, and, and things you have to be within a certain distance. Well, when you live in an amphitheater like we live in, uh, a single wolf, and, and part of the reason why the eight thousand feet, right, that was mentioned, because people more than eight thousand feet could hear the wolves, so they decided. Pshit, Right, and I, I know Steve's going to say you can hear. I can hear his lions a mile away, and that's the way it is. You, sound carries out there. Uh, one wolf is bad, but sixty of them is horrendous. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, we opened it specifically for uh, for Mr. McEwen's response. Pardon me. The commissioner's pleasure. Okay, come on, come on up and reintroduce yourself. If you would confine your comments to that issue. Yeah, I will. It's uh, I'm Steve Martin, and I'm coming up back up about the uh, no disrespect to anybody, but I have wolves. I have you know eight wolves. They howl a lot. My lions roar. The coyotes around that area are very loud around the area. They're just natural wildlife. But I have neighbors that live right next to my compound. They're 100 yards away. And they, the, for one thing, the wolves only howl two, three, maybe four times a day, if that. It lasts about three minutes, and then it's finished. Same with my lions. And I, you know, I find it a little disturbing when, because I went through the same thing with. Uh, the council years ago, they've been there 25 years, and people have moved in to the areas next to my compound and have no complaints. All my neighbors like me. They all like they like hearing the animals howl. And I find it a little disturbing that there's this big thing about, oh, it's, it's so disturbing. If you had a, a cabin or, or whatever close to that, actually it's a, a rather pleasant sound. When I got my CUP here 25 years ago, the head person in your council said she lived right next to Moore Park College. And she said, and she was the last one to vote, and she says, and I, I live next to Moore Park College, and I hear that lion roaring every day. And she says, it's a very pleasant sound, and I really like it. That's all i got to say is that it's not an unpleasant sound as far as I'm concerned, and my neighbors seem to like it. I just don't know why this, this huge vendetta about sound. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you for your comments. I don't know if Mr. Commissioner Westner was here then or not. <laughs> I started at 18. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and close the uh, public hearing. Um, uh, discussion? Maggie, Maggie anything? Uh, uh, while you're... While you're while you're composing your thoughts, I, I have um, I have one one issue uh, that I think staff needs to address, and that is the issue of insurance uh, that's required as part of the CUP compliance. 
Um, how does how does planning uh, um, confirm or know that uh, that the insurance policy is in effect? I understand that that one's been taken out, and I assume there was some documentation presented uh, during this process. But moving forward, what is that process to ensure compliance? Well. Initially, he had to submit. And that, where I'm coming from is, it, it, it's done. Uh, it's the policy's in place. It, when it, when any policy comes up for renewal, you have the option to renew or not renew. In worst case scenario, if it's not renewed or it's allowed to lapse, which would create a violation of the CUP, how would the county know that that policy has, has lapsed? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think. What needs to be taken into consideration is that we have 1.2 full-time employees dedicated to condition compliance. We are obligated pursuant to the ordinance to conduct an inspection at a minimum once of every three years. As a part of that inspection, we could request whatever information we need in order to verify compliance with the CUP conditions. Um, when it comes to the liability insurance, initially he was required, as Mr. Simmons was required to submit a certificate of liability insurance to demonstrate he had at least a million dollars worth of coverage. He did that. Um, that we did not see anything in the documentation which would lead us to believe that there was a problem with the insurance plan, so we're going to go with that. And unfortunately, I know some people don't like this, but we do have to take people on their word and trust them. Second is, if we got a complaint or an allegation that he was not maintaining the insurance, we would then have the authority pursuant to the ordinance to go ahead and make a request for a new certificate of liability of insurance to verify and demonstrate that he is complying with that. It's more of a reactive process at this point. And um, with the exception of conditions that need to be maintained on an ongoing basis, after applicants and permittees initially demonstrate compliance, we're probably not going to follow up unless we have good reason to believe, for example, from a complaint from somebody that they're not complying, and then we'll go ahead and conduct an investigation. So. Would it benefit your ability to ensure compliance if you received a copy of insurance renewal from the applicant on an annual basis? We got Once again, we have to balance out the need for receiving a document like that with time commitments and staffing levels. If the commission, for example, believed that it was warranted and appropriate, you could, for example, request a modification to the conditions to require that. Once again, I don't feel like it's necessary um, based upon, once again, the tools that are already in our tool chest with regard to enforcing the conditions of the CUP. We have to balance things out, I mean, in terms of staffing levels and our commitments. So. Commissioners, any other comments? I'd like to um, direct a question at County Council. Um, uh, we heard um, uh, concerns regarding the, the road, it being a private road. Um, what is the uh, county's role in, uh, in those easement agreements, the private road, the issue of the traffic on the road and the conditions that we have to reduce traffic on that road? Uh, is there uh, limits to what the county can do as far as being a party to that uh, agreement or what property owners in the area can do? Yes, there are limits as to, to what the county can do. The, the county, as, as you mentioned, the county has addressed the issue, albeit somewhat indirectly, by requiring the visitor book. Um, and we, the county does have the authority to... Um, regulate if the county so um, so chose to do to regulate car trips to and from the project site that that wasn't done in the CUP so that would that would be a change but so the county does have authority to regulate that sort of thing but in terms of um, getting involved with, with with the road and and requiring improvements to be made to the road that gets tricky because um, the, the testimony is it's a it's a commonly owned road or privately owned road, and so the county doesn't have authority to to get involved in those private issues. It's more um, the county has authority to regulate the traffic to and from the project and and impose those sorts of conditions. But in terms of the ownership of the road and or directing private parties to do 
things that's outside of our authority. And to follow up on that, is there anything that the county can do as far as the the disputes on the um, the uh, the worth of the property that's adjacent to this facility? Um, we heard testimony that there was a loss in value um, uh, because the the property can't be developed now because of this use. What's the the county's role in that issue? That would be a, a private matter, and. It, 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 there, there's there's civil, private civil legal remedies that that could theoretically be available to the neighbors. The the county um, issued the CUP in compliance with law and in compliance with the county's um, zoning ordinance. So the county's acted lawfully. If there's complaints from the private side about a loss of, of property value, that's a civil matter between the, the private parties. And um, and one more question. Uh, the purpose of, of this hearing was to hear a progress report. And um, when when I reviewed the hearing, um, it said that it would be uh, opened up again. Um, is that if if this commission finds that um, the the conditions have not been met, uh, is it possible to? Um, to, this isn't a revocation hearing, so I'm not really sure um, what we do with this information uh, about compliance with these conditions. So what's the Planning Commission's role today? That's a good question. The, the Planning Commission's role today is to, to, to listen to, to, to the status and, and it, um, in terms of follow-up, you can you could direct staff to, to look into issues or concerns that were, were raised today but um, your commission today doesn't have um, the ability to, to modify any of the conditions. You, you, you can help flesh out what the interpretation was, what your intent was, and, and have, sta have staff follow up accordingly. But you don't have um, the ability today to actually modify any of the conditions or to um, um, take any code violation type action against anyone. Um, that would those would be separate processes, and so there's um, specific um, procedures and notice requirements and separate hearing requirements that would that would apply um, to either modify a permit or to take code enforcement action. And so you, you could direct staff to, to look into those, look into initiating one of those separate processes. But that that would be the extent of what you could do today. Okay. The the only thing that I'm I'm having um, discomfort with is that uh, the visitors. Um, I think that we were very clear on that this was this would not be a public facility and that there would be no visitors. But um, you know, even people who are in support of the Lark are saying yes, we visited. Um, now there's some people who uh, who have you know official business there, like an employee or a volunteer. But um, uh, I'm wondering at this juncture. You know, I, I don't find that they've met that condition, you know, perhaps because the condition was tagged on at the at the end and it wasn't clear enough to say what we needed in terms of uh, keeping track of people and having documentation to show that indeed there are no visitors. There may be volunteers, there may be employees, there may be service people, but um, but that there would not be visitors. So um, I don't find that that um, you know, in receiving and, and filing this, I, I I don't know what my role is here because I don't find that to be um, true. I don't find that to be correct that they've complied with that condition because it wasn't uh, it wasn't clear enough that there was ambiguity. I, I you know the it, the. It's hard to prove a negative that we don't have visitors, but it is easy for you know for county to um, ask for compliance. In you know, can you keep a record of the people who come to your site and the date, and then keep track of those? Public hearings over. So um, I'm I'm having trouble on what the, the commission is going is supposed to do at this point because I can't make that finding that they have been able to meet condition two. Well, so, Commissioner Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, Minister Weston. Um, 
I agree and disagree with uh, Commissioner Dukas. Uh, again, I think you're correct. The fact that uh, the fact we called it a visitor or guest log created a problem. Supposedly, it's a login. Those of us who have ever attended secure facilities, we had to give our name, who we were as far as, you know, Southern California Edison, who we were going to see, when we arrived, what was the reason for the visit. Uh, the fact that we didn't give the proper specificity to the applicant of the information that we wanted, uh, we wound up into a redacted situation. Uh, again, unless you disclose to a private person in a private situation that you're going to take their private information, and make it public, they don't have the opportunity to uh, decline. And we have heard one person say that. So I think the ambiguity, which the commissioner properly said, was there. So that created the confusion. And that's what I see, that the, the clarity of what the login should have been uh, was not there. I do believe an attempt was made to record information of those who came and went, uh, again, uh, if the commissioner feels it didn't rise to the appropriate level to prevent visitation and guests, which is the intent to control traffic. Uh, again, I think it comes back to an ambiguity. If this commission were to provide clarity to staff of the information we wish to have, and also again clarity to the applicant, the purpose, uh, I think we can do that. Uh, but I cannot support violating them on that alone at this point in time. Uh, th those points are well taken. And I don't have a problem with the redaction because I do feel that because it was so heated and there's such strong feeling, I think people's uh, privacy is appropriately protected. Um, but the county's legitimate purpose in this is to monitor a condition that is in no other way enforceable. I don't know how else you could have uh, it enforced that there, it not be open to the public and there be no visitors uh, without this, uh, you know, if you have a better idea, uh, you should have said something before. Uh, so, so what we do here is we just, um, I've heard from council that, uh, that we can't modify the conditions. Is that correct? We can't modify them? Can we clarify them? Commissioner Dukas, I think that we've heard enough, uh, um, testimony today and, and I believe that I've heard the permittee say that they're willing to clarify the conditions so I think that we would just simply do that with a permit adjustment we would take into consideration what everybody has said Commissioner McGee said it should be called a business appointment book and I agree a guest book is probably not a good term and then I also heard that the purpose of the visit was important that everybody in and out outside of their personal um, folks visiting at their personal residence uh, the time in the time out and the book is to be bound so I heard that um, and so we can clearly um, enter uh, or, or process a permit adjustment to make that language a lot clearer but I would also agree with Commissioner Westner when we said what you needed to do and then the documentation said the permittee shall maintain a guest book and they did right so and so I think that, you know, given the year and, and given that hindsight is 2020, we can go back and, and clarify. And, and I heard the uh, applicant agree to that. So we will do that. No other comments? No, uh, this uh, won't, we won't, uh, we won't hear this matter again, correct? You wouldn't hear it unless it was appealed. So the, the, the processing of a permit adjustment is, is a, a decision subject to appeal. So you might hear it on appeal. And we won't hear the, a, a progress report on LARC again. Is it possible to have another progress report? I believe when we had the last hearing, it was a one-year progress report. And then the, uh, the county, unless this one has a specific condition on it, reviews them once every three years are up at the site but then other folks such as the animal regulation folks are there annually as well as the u.s department of agriculture is there annually so they have annual visits by state and federal to be able to keep the animals but the county uh, reviews it on complaint or once every three years okay so uh so this would be the appropriate point to say uh, good luck to you. It sounds like it's a needed facility. Good luck to you on your private matters with regard to your, 
your private road and uh, and your development. I would uh, I would echo that those comments. Uh, I would also uh, admonish you that that you need to be, have a clear understanding of what the terms and conditions of CUP are, and and where some things might be arguable. Uh, some things, uh, if there's an issue of violation down the road, uh, other other things may be very objectively uh, provable. And I speak to the issue of insurance uh, that it be maintained, because in my mind that would clearly be a violation of CUP. And you know where I'm going. Yeah. With that, I assume I would. Uh, I assume we can uh, receive and file the status report is that correct then uh, that concludes the matter thank you uh, we're going to take a five minute break and come right back with i'd like to reconvene the meeting so if i can ask uh, the folks in the audience to step outside to continue the conversations bang bang Thank you. Let's uh, reconvene the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, item number seven, PL 13-0131. Staff report. Just waiting for the PowerPoint. There we go. Good morning, good morning, Chair Rodriguez, members of the Commission. My name is Charles Anthony. I'm a planner with the Ventura County Planning Division. The applicant, Mr. Brian Bladen, has requested that a variance uh, to allow, in order to allow him to construct, or to, rather to remodel, an, exi an existing single family residence and to construct a single vehicle carport. Project is located just south of the C city of Simi Valley, just south also of Highway 118 in the Santa Susana Hills area. You can see from the photo, the site is also located lo uh, near Clear Springs Road. It is within a rural residential area, and it is um, also um, the uh, there's no plan to change any of the zoning or any anything other than to request the variance. Is the is the sound okay? Okay. Okay. The um, this is a view looking from Clear Springs Road. As you can see, the I'll point it out to you um, on the screen here. This is the existing single-family dwelling that would be remodeled with some minor um, demolition. Where the dumpster is right now is where the proposed single-vehicle carport would be located. And this is the access easement, driveway easement, for the neighbor here to the east. And this is the neighbor's only means of access. This access easement, driveway easement, is located on the subject property. What, what is the neighbor's address? It's 6651 at Thank Clear you. Springs Road. This is another view, just giving you a, a, a clearer view of what, and a more zoomed in view, of what the um, actual uh, easement and driveway, this design, the shape of it here. You can see that it's, um, it's elevated. It doesn't allow for the applicant or the owner of the property to be able to utilize or share that easement. And so what it, the effect of it is to actually reduce the amount of usable space on the subject property by approximately 800 feet. Again, this here, this dumpster is where the proposed carport would be located. Again, just another view here, you're getting an idea, again, of how it's, how it's been designed out there previously, giving, getting you a little idea, a little bit of the slope. You'll see some more photos in a minute about what the slope, how the slope looks, the topography. And then this photo here uh, then gives you an idea of, oops, go back. This photo here then shows you this would be the way that the subject 
for the subject property, they, people would exit out onto Clear Springs Road. That car over there is on Clear Springs Road, parked on the side. Okay, this is a view of the westerly side yard area. And you can see, again, getting an idea of the slope, how it slopes. That actually slopes down towards the north. And if the carport were to be located, a, if, even if it was a tandem or a single carport to be located in there, it would still violate the side yard setback area. It would be very jammed up in that area. So we'd still be looking at a variance, even if it was located there. Okay, and this is another view. Um, just looking north, now this is actually looking rather south, still within the Wesley side yard area. And you can get an idea, uh, again, of how large and how high that, that um, driveway easement for the neighbors is located up here. That's, that's the neighbor's easement? You, it is. It was in your previous for slide? For that 6651 uh, neighbor to the east of the subject property. And, and so it was 6641 then? Where six, is that? That is located to the west. Yeah, and well, I'll, I think I have a photo coming okay. up on that in just a moment. Rather, let me go back, and my, I think this one will be a better, give, at least give you an idea. This over here, where this um, little Mini Cooper is located in there, that would be the neighbor 6641 located to the west. Um, I, ha I do have, a, not in this slide presentation, but since the comment was added and I received it today, um, I did bring a photo, if we wanted to enter that exhibit, showing the 6641 um, address, location, subject property. So if you'd like me to enter that as an exhibit, I can. Okay, I'll do that right now. Okay, and this next view, while you're having a chance to look at this, this next view, again, looking at the westerly side yard area, and this is a north elevation view of the existing dwelling that would be remodeled on the outside as well. The, the remodeling is actually rather minor. Um, this would, they'd be adding cement plaster to the outside of this and, and uh, doing a few uh, window replacement here and there. But uh, the actual footprint of the as dwelling to be remodeled will actually be reduced a little bit, and you'll see some more of that in the next photos. This is the easterly side yard area, and um, again, you're looking. We're looking at a, a small area that would be um, that would um, be located if they were to um, place the carport, covered carport, in that area. It'd be really narrow. Um, it'd be difficult for them to access, and I'll show you that as well. It would require the removal of this oak tree and um, also require additional construction and grading that others um, in the neighborhood would not have to be, not required to do. And this photo, this shows, uh, this portion on the outside here um, shows the area of the enclosed addition that will actually be removed, the, the de demolition that's part of this project. Okay, this again, just looking at the easterly side yard area. This time I'm up on the top of the property close to Clear Springs Road, looking down, looking north. And so again, you're looking at a narrow area for them uh, if they were to try to build in that location. Uh, this the, is the area in the, the where dumpster, the trader was at the, in the previous photograph. For the dumpster, is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, uh, is, no, this it's, is beyond where the dumpster was. Yeah, this, that, the dumpster location is actually in the northern part, uh, rather the southern part of okay. the parcel. This so this is, is looking east. around the corner of yeah, the structure. Yeah, exactly, this is peeking around the corner. Thank exactly. you. Okay. How, wide, how wide is that area uh, between the, the house that area, and the fence? It's approximately, that area is about... 15 to 18 feet. I don't have the plans right in front of me, but it's about 15. So conceivably, you could fit in a 18, um, a nine foot wide carport. Um, that would be a tandem carport. The problem is, is the accessing of it and how it would be built on that slope. I'll go back to that slide. 
So in order for it to be level with the driveway coming off of Clear Springs Road, if we were to try to locate it in the side easterly um, um, area there, you would have to either put it up on piles or posts, or you'd have to increase the grading and, and soil underneath and build that up to locate that carport on it. So that was considered an unnecessary hardship that other neighbors have not had to do in order for them just to provide parking for their space. Okay, the history and background. Um, in 2005, the Ventura County Resource Management Agency confirmed violations for unpermitted construction activities involving, involving the existing single-family dwelling. MTI Capital, who is the current owner, was not the owner at the time when the county confirmed these violations. In 2013, the current owner, MTI Capital, signed a compliance agreement with the Code Compliance Division stating that it would abate all violations related to the structure. The proposed project will abate those violations. Okay, project description. Violations, as mentioned, will be abated by obtaining a zoning clearance and necessary building permits, which will permit the existing structural additions. Minor demolition related to some of the unpermitted additions is proposed. That's what's shown that area would be about 120 square feet that would be removed as part of the project. And continuing with the project description, the, it includes the remodeling of the interior and exterior of the existing dwelling and the addition of a single vehicle carport. The applicant requests a variance to allow the single vehicle carport within the front setback area. What, what again, just want to emphasize, and we'll show this in the plans. So this is the... This hair area here in the dark line, the darkest lines, is the existing dwelling. It's a little difficult to see, but this section over here would actually be removed, shown in that photo slide earlier, and that's about 120 square feet. This area is uh, uh, approximately the same uh, footprint, structural footprint, of the original building from the circa 1930s. So they're not expanding out any further um, in terms of the actual structural footprint. This is where the proposed carport would be located. This is where the access easement for the neighbor over here at 6651. Again, their only means of accessing Clear Springs Road is using this easement on the subject property. So this takes out about 800 feet of an already 4,700 square foot lot. So it, then the lot effectively is less than 4,000 square feet of, on which uh, the applicant or the owner can build uh, something, a resident, make a residential use out of it. Again, this area is zoned for residential, rural residential use, and it's RE zoning. How wide is that area on the left side of the structure? This area over here? It's, yeah. it, this area, um, in the, this is the westerly yeah. this is our area. It's approximately 12 feet. So it, it, you could fit in, uh, you could actually fit in a carport within that area, um, but you would be violating the side yard setbacks there. So if we were to try to put that in here, it would be violating. So that, that. would that would require a variance. We would. And that and that portion of the lot is adjacent to sixty six forty seven. Uh, six forty one, I believe. Is forty one. Excuse me. Yeah, over here. So, okay. thank you. Coming back over to the westerly, kind of follow up on on what you were just pointing out, Chairman, is that over here in this side yard area in the westerly, or rather the easterly side yard area. If they were to try to construct a, a two-car tandem carport, they could do that with, by staying outside the setback area. The problem would be for them to access it, making this narrow corner and to be able to, to make that narrow 90-degree turn in there. And then, as I said before, either they'd have to, in order for them to be level with this driveway area, they would have to build this carport on some kind of piles or some kind of columns um, in order for them to do that. And again, it would be considered something that's sort of out of character with this neighborhood that other neighbors within the vicinity are not required to do, have not been required to do. And again, they're just trying to make a reasonable residential use out of this site. 
the other, uh, one other item here, the parking, this driveway from this end of the proposed carport down to the property line is approximately 36 feet. So if you took, that actually is consistent with the amount of parking distance or space area for our zoning ordinance, which requires a typical parking space to be 18 feet in length. So if you have two 18 foot length spaces, of course that's 36 feet, which is it's almost exactly this. This length of this, I'm sorry, this driveway here to the property line. Okay, the carport. A carport is approximately nine feet by 20 feet long. It's about nine feet high. And this is just an elevation of what would be the finished product and project out there on the site. This is a western view. Um, anything in the dash lines indicates that it would be the removal. So that window, for instance, would be covered over. And again, they'll be covering over this with like a cement plaster. When you say west, could you redefine that by front, rear? Oh, I'm sorry. That would be a side. That would be a side view. Okay. Okay, and then this is the north elevation, and this would be the rear view. Thank and you. so it's a rear facing against the fence, the rear fence. And you can see again these dash lines. This is all that area that's going to be demolished, removed to reduce the um, actual structural footprint to an area that would be within the original, uh, approximately the original structural uh, footprint built back from the 1930s. This is another side view, and you can see again the slope shows the dramatic slope going down this way. And this is, um, this is the east view. And then more to the south. And the south, this is actually the front. This is the front of the building. Um, and this is the front facing out towards Clear Springs Road. The dashed lines here indicates that this is, would be the removal of the existing chimney that's here right now. Without going through the diagrams again, what's what would be the clearance between the the uh, proposed uh, side of that structure and the carport? It's, it's supposed to be six feet, which is in accordance with the uh, zoning ordinance. Code. So there'd be a sixteen foot six gap feet, between sorry, the six. two. Yeah, six. Thank you. Okay, this is just the floor plans, and this is the lower floor plans. It's approximately six hundred and fifty square feet. This is what exists today and would be permitted as part of, if the variance is approved, they then would be eligible to get the zoning clearance and the building plans that would make this, um, this existing area. They're going to add a wall and do a little bit of uh, renovation and remodeling inside, but this, uh, but this does exist at this time. Next is the upper floor, and this is a little bit larger. The upper floor is about 700 square feet. Some minor remodeling will go on inside there. Okay, CEQA. The project was found to be categorically exempt pursuant to the existing facilities uh, class of exemptions that have to do with remodeling, addition, and construction of single-family dwellings, and then also exempt under Section 15305, minor alterations involving a variance. Okay, the findings is that the, in the zoning ordinance, the first standard for variance is that there are special circumstances or exceptional characteristics applicable to the subject property with regard to its size, shape, and topography, which don't generally apply to other properties in the same vicinity. And the findings by the staff were that because, let's go to the next slide, was that because of its relatively small size and the reduced buildable area as shown by the access easement of the neighbors, and when you combine that with a 20-foot setback that has to be taken from the easement, not from Clear Springs Road, but from the easement, it results in special circumstances that prevent the establishment of conforming parking. Conforming parking, of course, is two covered, would be two covered uh, parking spaces. Okay, standard number two is that the granting of the requested variance will not confer a special privilege and consistent with the limitations upon other properties in the same vicinity and zone. And the findings by the planning division is that special, special circumstances limit the number of parking spaces, as I mentioned before. 
the applicant's request to use the residentially zoned property for residential purposes as reasonable, and it's enjoyed by others in the immediate vicinity, which does not confer a special privilege. Again, the sole purpose of a variance, as you all know, is to make reasonable use of one's property with some adjustments to the development standards, and that's really what's happening here. Charles? Yes. Just so I'm clear on this. Sure. Where the carport would go, you said there was almost about the same amount of footage driving back out to the street from there, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't follow. Well, you've got this single car carport, and if you're backing out of it all the way out into the street, there's a there's an amount of length of, of driveway there you said that was approximately the same as the carport length. Is that That's correct. correct, yes. So, so two car, so you basically have a tandem parking situation. Yes, you can. So there's so adequate parking for two that cars. The second car is not going anywhere it shouldn't be. I mean, it's on the property and the easement. They would be located on their property, and if they stayed within that 36 feet, and it's even possible, in fact, let me go back to this slide. It might make it a little easier to see. I'm going to use that, um, the site plan. So if we were to, if, if you can see from there, so this, again, from the, east, from the distance here to here is 36 feet, and the carport is about 20 feet. They could squeeze in another car between the property line and the edge of this carport, a second car. There's enough distance for them, at least by our ordinance code, which says 18 feet is your standard car length and car space dimension. They don't, they don't own a Prius, do they? <laughs> and that's really generous. It's so actually quite You quite could have a tandem covered parking, but then you'd have a setback problem. Is that right? We'd have a setback problem. And also, because this, as you saw from that one first, I won't go back to the photo right now unless you'd like me to. But also, it, because there's such a narrow area to enter into this site, it would impede uh, fire personnel in case of event of a fire. They would have that whole another carport, nine feet high, you know, uh, another eight, nine feet wide, or nine feet wide, blocking them from being able, fire personnel in case in the event of a fire. And this is a, higher, a high fire hazard area. So that's one of the reasons why we thought it made more sense to keep that open. Yes, they can still use it as a tandem uh, parking space if, they, if necessary, but uh, we wanted to leave it open just in case the fire personnel would be obstructed by any kind of additional carport that would, as, as you said, also violate the side setbacks as well. Can I get you to back up to that sure. slide again? This Where's the tree located the that, tree. That, that you identified earlier? It's this one here. And the, the, it looks like it would likely, I think in the staff report it says, it would uh, either need to be altered or removed. Um, because so it's beyond the property line? It is beyond the property line. It's just beyond it. But the, considering the root structure and the rest of it, that uh, technically it's not on their legal lot, but um, it would likely have to be removed um, or at least altered as a way for them to try to squeeze in a second uh, two-car tandem parking in this area. If, and that is even if they could access the, through this sort of narrow turning area here. I think I was on the third standard. Okay, standard number three, that strict application of the zoning regulations as they apply to the subject property will result in practical difficulties or unnecessary hardships that are inconsistent with the purpose of the regulations. And the finding was by staff was that the two covered parking requirement outside the setback area would result in difficulties and unnecessary hardships. If the two-car tandem parking was attempted in the eastern side yard area, such parking may not be accessible, as mentioned, because of that sharp 90-degree turn, and would demand grading construction not required of other properties in the vicinity. Variance number four, that such variance will not confer or will not cause a detriment to the public health, safety, or welfare, nor the use enjoyment of neighboring properties. And the finding was that the staff analyzed the project and found it to be consistent with event, the general plan policies and the zoning ordinance requirements. Also, other staff, other county and non-county agencies, such as Fire Department, Environmental Health Division, 
Caltrans Environmental Department. They were consulted, and none identified any evidence that the project would be inconsistent with this standard. Public noticing is that um, in accordance with the zoning ordinance, the hearing was published in the Ventura County Star, was mailed to property owners within 300 feet of the property, uh, staff notified and requested comments from the City of Simi Valley and the Ventura County Code Compliance Division. One comment from Santa Susana Knowles in support of the project was received by the Planning Division after this staff report was published. Um, and also, since, as you probably have received this morning, was a new um, comment, a written testimony in opposition to the project, and, and I'm sure that she'll have a chance to speak in a moment. Okay, recommended actions. Uh, we, the Planning Division recommends that your commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and the exhibits, that you find the project is categorically exempt pursuant to the classes that I mentioned earlier, that you make the findings to grant a variance pursuant to the non-coastal zoning ordinance based on the substantial evidence in the staff report, that, you, that the commission grant the variance, and that you specify that the planning commission, uh, the custodian, is the planning commission for the documents and the record. Okay, that concludes my presentation portion. Of course, I'm available for any questions that you might have. And, and that's all I have for right now. Okay, can I uh, get disclosures, please? Commissioner Maggie? No disclosures. Commissioner Dukas? I have no disclosures. Commissioner West? <clears throat> no disclosures. Um, I'm reasonably familiar with the area in my previous life, going back 40 plus years ago, I probably drove a patrol car on that lane, so that's my only disclosure. Commissioner Dukas. Um, have you had a chance to look at the um, the letter uh, in opposition to the variance? I did. I just had a chance to read it this morning. And uh, what um, conditions does the county have in place um, during the construction period Other with regard to the construction cars parking, the issue that's raised in the letter? Nothing was specifically ad addressed to that to the construction other than the normal requirements from building and safety, um, from the transportation department, that other codes that they would have to comply with. In terms of, of course, um, I know there's concerns in, expressed in the letter that the parking could be located on her, on her portion. Again, as I heard from the previous uh, case discussed today, that's not typically a matter that the planning division would re address directly. Um, as, as I said, because the amount of new construction is rather limited in the sense of demolition and then remodeling, there wasn't, it wasn't seen that that would be a necessary conditions at this time, at that time we wrote the staff report. So um, that would be a, a private matter between the two property owners and the county can't impose conditions, even if we, if we wanted to? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that. If if the con, if the neighbor's concern is that um, parking is the 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 subject property is going to park cars in the in the joint easement and, and block their access, then yes, that would be a private matter. And um, just to, to to clarify, the um, the the county and your commission um, can condition the variance, and so you would have to make a connection between. The variance and any parking issue having to having to do with construction. I, I haven't heard that connection. I, I I might not have heard everything, but th that's that's your authority for conditioning the project, um, and so you have to make that link. And so I'm not sure if one exists, but that that would be your sole authority to condition the project. It, does that muddy the water more? Or? No, I'm just wondering if the, if the county is in a position to put. I mean, it's a temporary situation. So I don't know um, a lot of a lot of impacts that are temporary or, you know, they they pass. Right, and so that that tells me then the the, the situation is probably not. It's for you to decide, but it's probably not being caused by the variance as much as a temporary construction issue. And so then again, that would get back to well, 
if if there's a, an overuse or misuse of this this easement, then that's a private matter. There is one construction condition that's applied, but it's just for noise. It's just to limit the period of construction from that seven to seven period, um, weekdays, and then nine to seven on weekends, so that the construction so the neighbors won't have to endure loud construction noise at five o'clock in the morning. But that but that does not address the construction parking that you addressed. And then, um, if the variance is not granted, what do they do to park? How do you get the it to be uh, legal? That's the rub. Um, we, um, in order for them to make the reasonable residential use of the property, we really weren't left with any other alternatives that we thought were um, reasonable for the applicant that would not be considered an unnecessary hardship on the applicant relative to that neighborhood. Um, so we really are in a bind, and that's one of the reasons why we thought the building where they suggested they could still get two car spaces, two parking spaces in there as, as Commissioner um, as the uh, co commissioner member mentioned we're looking at still plenty of space and we have a smaller compact car that could be placed there um, so that's that's our, our bind that we're in for that area Thank you So with the two cars even big ones uh, they would not be blocking the 6641's easement into their place, correct? Assuming that they're 18 feet or, you know, both cars were, you know, total combined length together of 36 feet or less. And that's, that's, they probably still, even if we, they were, had a little longer driveway, which in that one showing the site plan, they could probably make that driveway a little longer. So they could probably maybe make it 38, 40 feet. Um, so we're talking about that much more length, tandem length that they could make out of that driveway. So, so during this construction, uh, are there other places to park? A you know, construction workers have trucks full of tools and materials and so forth. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that photo. Um, I'll go back to the slide. Let's look at the. We'll look at the site plan. So, and that they could. They could park temporarily in here in the side setback area. It's wide enough. It's, as I said, it's approximately 10 or 12 feet. And so they could probably squeeze. It depends how big the construction vehicle was. They'd have to smooth out some of the surface. There are some steps here now. But, you know, conceivably, if it's, if it's not too wide, they could probably get it in there. They would not be able to get it back in here. So then they'd be left with, unless, let me go back to that side one more time unless they're able to you know, build the carport last and then do the remodeling here. And then once they finish this, or finish rather the remodeling in, on the main dwelling, then they could, um, they could use this parking space and then finish off the, the last bit of construction with the carport. Um, so the, we're still talking about some limited parking, that is true. I'll go back to the slide that probably sh that shows um, Clear Springs Road. So this is Clear Springs Road. This is a view of it. This is uh, the, um, the neighbor who is opposed to the variance. This is her, uh, her property. This is a small little parking area on the side. And you can see, I, I don't think I, I can zoom in on these PowerPoints from here. But anyway, but if you look down the street, um, because this is substandard, um, it's an area of substandard parking that the Transportation Department has mapped. Um, we're looking at a lot of people are parking, squeezing in their parking here. Uh, of course, this, as, as you well know, this is an area where a lot of the construction and, and development is, is out of compliance uh, with the zoning ordinance because much of this predated the zoning ordinance um, regulations to begin with. So anyway, so we have this. So this, you know, assuming that there wasn't a car parked here, they could probably could park on this space over here. And then, as I mentioned in the the site plan uh, shot before, they might be able to squeeze in some parking there as well. Well, the kind of remodeling you're talking about, construction you're talking about, you don't need any large rigs as I see it. It's going to be maybe larger pickups with materials in the back and so forth. You know, on that, I might have the, uh, the applicant, if is the applicant here today? Uh, if maybe he might be better able to answer that question if that would be okay. Sure. Okay, I have... Uh, before the speaker speaks, I have one 
speaker card, and you were the applicant? Correct. Um, and the paperwork indicates that, where'd I lose it here? You're Brian Bald Bladen. Bladen? Yes. Are you the actual property owner? Or are you a representative of the property owner? Uh, I own the company MTI Capital and therefore also own the home. Okay. So you don't reside at the residence? No, I do not. You don't have any intention to reside at the residence? I do not. Okay. Um, go ahead. So, to, thank you for having me, Commission. Um, to answer your question, uh, the remodel work is very limited, smaller work. Um, our company has done hundreds of jobs throughout the county uh, over the last six and a half years with the intention really to bring homes such as the subject property up to standard, uh, up to current code and put them in compliance, uh, something we, we generally uh, uh, feel that the neighborhood uh, appreciates so that they don't have homes that are run down such as the subject property. Um, we don't intend to try and interfere with anybody's driveway um, with the work that is proposed. We do intend to uh, work directly with our contractors and subcontractors so that they are aware of the circumstances with the very limited access and parking in the neighborhood. Um, You've been up there. Obviously. I've been up there a number of times, yes. Okay. You're acquainted previously with that area? Prior to the purchase of this home, I've had a few homes in that vicinity, but nothing with the limitations and size restraints that this one presents. Okay. But yeah, just to clarify, you know, we are trying to do our best to bring everything to compliance. We've been working with planning uh, with Charles for the past year plus, uh, trying to get to this point, and I've tried to uh, meet any requests or requirements that have been brought to us so that we could get this variance hopefully approved and uh, you know remove another eyesore from the neighborhood because the house is in pretty bad shape if you were to look at it um, cosmetically and in order to do that we do need the parking so um, I don't really have anything further to say unless you have other questions you could direct at me. Commissioner Dukas. How much oversight do you have on your subcontractors? Have you seen the letter that complained about um, the, the driveway being locked? Have you had a chance to look at it? I received that letter this morning. Uh -huh. uh, that was the first time I was aware of it, and I did read it. Um, as a concern, I would, I would certainly not want any of my contractors to put other uh, neighbors in that sort of situation and, and really just an outright... Uh, show disrespect from them by not uh, accommodating the neighbor's needs. Um, with that said, I am not on the job site daily. Um, in the past, when this property was purchased, I had a foreman uh, that was someone on the job site. Uh, again, not daily, but on a regular, you know, two to three times a week basis to work with contractors. We had to do some preliminary work. Uh, in regards to the septic system and a few other things to determine what we could do with the property. Um, and moving forward, yes, I'm going to be intricately involved. I do have uh, contractors that I, I meet with and speak with daily that you know would be aware that the parking, there's, there's not going to be any reason for them to block parking. If they need to park on our property within uh, the space we have allotted that will not interfere with the other driveways, uh, definitely not with the easement and blocking the other neighboring driveway, and then just the street in general. I mean, the, the trucks that our contractors use are, you know, three-quarter to one-ton regular trucks, you know, that have been converted, you know, the truck beds to hold equipment, hold tools. Uh, we don't have semis. We don't have large box trucks. Uh, the only time that might ever come up would be if there is a delivery of material, but a delivery would basically require them pulling up on the street, unloading the material, our people bringing it directly onto the job site, and then that truck leaving. So there could be moments of inconvenience, but I would hope in my uh, oversight and management of the subs and contractors that I can make it very clear that they're not to uh, limit traffic uh, beyond what would be necessary. 
uh, for the work to take place. Well, um, I'm hearing two different things. One is that you can manage it, or your sub, your your uh, foreman can manage it, um, where the work takes place sequentially, mm -hmm. so you don't slam it with all these cars at once. Right. And the other is, naturally, when people have things delivered, you know, carpeting, drywall, things that come in big trucks. I mean, everybody has that, and everybody. Has, there's nothing unique about this um, project that makes that any different than than anybody else that has work done on their house. Even you know, delivering a refrigerator, people big big uh, box trucks uh, block the driveway. So that's what you're talking about when you say as often as necessary. Or right, and, necessary. and I, I would only see that happening a few times, um, and hopefully we can coordinate it with our you know the, the delivery people to. Do it at times that are either you know not going to affect neighbors, maybe they're at work, so that it's a time where we can get in and out of there without affecting anybody. Yeah, I, I, I see. I see that as as being something different than the actual management of the of the project. And uh, do we have your assurance that there'll be a contact person yeah. that she can that yep. she can call uh, and 100%, say, "Hundred percent, definitely." Um, I I need these cars moved now. Yes. Or whatever it is. Definitely. And okay. I, and our intentions with the former foreman uh, who no longer works with us, um, when we get a job like this, we tend to try to make ourselves known to the neighbors that there is transparency, that they can communicate. Um, I did read in the letter that attempts had been made to contact me. I've never been contacted. Uh, I'm not even aware that they had my direct number. They may have tried to call our office. They may have tried to call the past foreman uh, who does not work with us. Um, I apologize if there was any sort of lack of communication and intend to correct that so that they do have my direct phone number and can contact me directly as the person of contact. Good. Thank you. So was the uh, that past foreman around when the the uh, when he dropped off the large bin and had lunch and when she asked him to leave it took an hour? I mean I don't quite understand why that would take an hour. Whether or not the foreman was physically there, I do not know. He, based on the dates of the slides, he was employed uh, by us through February of this year. Um, so if, if you're basing it off the slide and the incident took place during the time that these slides are showing up until a point in February, then uh, yes, he should have been aware. Uh, whether he communicated that to me, I have no idea. I was never in contact uh, on a specific issue such as blocked parking. Um, but moving forward is, you know, all I can commit to is that our goal is to make sure that there is an open line of communication, and that and, that, and that open line would be to you directly to me. And so, uh, Miss Murray would have your number. Correct. Okay. I will give it to her after right. this meeting. Just for the record, um, I would say that the comments we're making as regard or as relates to the neighbor is a letter received marked as Exhibit B. Mm -hmm. um, written by uh, Jerry Jarine, uh by uh, Mrs. Murray. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Just clarify that. Now, the only other letter I was aware of was one written uh, in recommendation of the variance by the, I guess it's the Santa Susana HOA or whatever that is present there. Okay. Um, you're in the business, and I... Uh, but your comments about coordinating is almost pie in the sky in a lot of ways. I mean, I've done mm -hmm. remodels and, you know, I've dealt with contractors and they say the delivery is going to be here at a certain time and it doesn't show up uh, or it doesn't show up when it's scheduled to show up. And when it does show up, uh, they tend to be on, they tend to be pretty quick to get in and get out. Uh, but you can't, I mean, personal, personal perspective. And I I know the area. I I probably driven that lane. They're very narrow. Um, blocking somebody in uh, for however length of time it is is an, is an inconvenience. And we'll speak to this letter in a moment. But obviously, some it occurred in the past, and the response was less than responsive. If in fact, you know, the the neighbor was delayed up to approximately an hour before they could actually leave their own residence. Um, I'm assuming it's because whoever was there was having lunch or otherwise occupied. But 
That's not the kind of responsiveness I think you're indicating to this commission that would occur. No, no. Uh, by responsiveness, if if in the event there was a vehicle blocking said driveway, uh, my expectation would be that if I'm contacted immediately or they cannot make contact and have it moved immediately, that I get it moved immediately uh, by means of contacting those that I contract to be at the property uh, and that are working for me. So, uh, you know, an hour, totally unacceptable. A couple minutes, I feel, is realistic. You know, if they're right in the middle of something and they have to finish a cut on something, I'm just throwing that out there. I would expect them to finish that within a minute or two, get their keys, get to the vehicle, pull out, and allow that individual to come and go as needs be. As a neighbor, I think I would, uh, I would want to know beforehand how long they're going to be blocked in. Mm -hmm. so that when your driver arrives or your employee arrives they let the neighbor know that they're going to be there for 15 or 20 minutes or ask if it's going to be an inconvenience and I realize again it's pie in the sky because what you and I say is not what necessarily gets conveyed right. um, or is interpreted by the field but um, it's an issue that's that's, uh, that's obviously here and, and, and needs to be addressed if this in fact goes forward right uh, in, in all honesty, I'm not that I'm happy that the incident took place, but I'm I am better off knowing that it did, so that we can take whatever mm -hmm. measures necessary so that it doesn't happen again. And to try and your it. your company bought the property in 2013. Correct. And you have nothing to do with the construction that's there now. No, it, all, all the existing uh, notices of non-compliance code violations were pre-existing. Uh, we tend to buy a lot of properties like this. With and you, the, you were aware of that when you bought the property? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. With the intention to try and resolve these issues. Okay. Do it all the time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jory Janae Murray. I'm at 6641 Clear Springs Road in Simi Valley, the unincorporated area of Simi Valley known as Santa Susana Knowles. Um, I live directly to the west of 6647. I've lived there for over 20 years. I've remodeled my house. I understand what he's saying. It's a total eyesore next door. Um, my issues are they showed you the the slides where their easement where they could make a driveway to go in um, but they can't do it because of the wall and the grade so they have to come through my driveway um, that easement's been in place since the 70s we've always complied with the 32 foot opening you can see it my denali's park there there there's not another picture but it goes the driveway goes in where i park my car and where my daughter parks her car. And that's where the problem comes in from where they come in and out. Um, Is there, the, was there a photo that shows what you're saying? There's a photo of the Mini Cooper that my daughter drives. Can we get that up? I believe, well, there's a, a small. The, uh, there's a small scene on the slide, but the, the full picture I handed to you that showed that. But if you'd like me to, I can go to that slide. It was before. Um, we'll enter this photo into the record uh, uh, that we received, but uh, directed to staff, would you uh, explain what this photograph depicts? Or, or, maybe, or maybe the speaker can. Oh, oh there's the Cooper. Okay, okay. Okay, so where the Mini Cooper parks, my. Do you need the pointer? Oh, I don't. Okay. <laughs> The top one. Okay, this is my daughter's Mini Cooper. This is the property line here. They have an easement to come in with a 32-foot opening on it would be the south side, I think. I'm not quite sure. South side. Mm -hmm. So I leave a 32-foot opening. We park the Denali um, at part of it, and then there's 32 feet for them to come through. 
and get through their driveway. The problem is, is that they don't stay within that property line. And I'm not saying it's Mr. Biden. It's 20 years of people coming and going. 20 years of friends, 20 years of trucks, 20 years of, you know, construction. When I bought my house, this house at 6647 was originally a studio with no downstairs. It was built on sticks. Um, it has since been converted to a somehow two-story home without permits, which adds more people to the house, which adds more cars. Um, and they pull in and they just block the, my daughter's car and my car. And sometimes trucks hit the Denali when they're coming in and out. We have um, maintenance issues on the driveway that nobody has ever helped us maintain it. So when Mr. Biden bought it, at that point, we even tried to buy it from him because we, we were so tired of this parking issue and me being late for work and my daughter being late for work. Um, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I work for the studios. I have to be out by uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. And while cars are blocking me in here because they come in at, late at night, I have to go bang on windows and doors at 4 o'clock in the morning so that I can get in my car, and I can't wake anybody up. So now I'm late for work. Um, this has happened several times. I'm not opposed to them remodeling, but what needs to be fixed is that they can't cross that line so that we can't come and go. An easement is for them to drive through to get to their property so that I don't landlock them. But they're basically blocking me in because nobody cares. You know, Mr. Biden seems to care today, but what's going to happen when those trucks come in and he's not here? You know, I have to call him up. Now he has to call them up. You know, at 4 o'clock in the morning, who's going to be answering the phone? Um, those are my issues. They're, you know, it's not that I don't want them to go forward with the project. I don't want the house. I just want the parking situation over with. I've spent so many years dealing with it that when he bought the property, I was very excited. But then when I found out he was going to flip it, and it'll be a whole new set of issues that come in again when the house gets sold. So there's no relationship that will ever be built in order for him to care enough. Hopefully he will. I don't know. I believe in people. Um, but what I don't want to happen because because he can't use his easement because of the other house, he's using my property. And that dumpster s sat at that property line with a truck that blocked us in for over an hour. They had to actually push that dumpster back. And, it, and they didn't speak English. And I'm sure they were doing an excellent job. But I couldn't get, I had to get on the phone and try to track down some property manager um, who then had to call them, and by then I was an hour late getting in my car to go to work. And, you know, I'm a makeup department head on a TV show, and if I don't show up, actors don't get made up, and that TV show doesn't get made for the morning. Um, and then my job is at risk. So I guess, you know, I'm over. I'm over it. I need some kind of condition. I'm not opposed to the variance, but I need some kind of condition that I can come back and say they're not complying with it and something something can be done, if that's possible. Um, while you're standing there, as we're looking at this photograph, um, in essence, you're saying the property line is basically runs across that driveway right at the, where that block driveway, block type of driveway ends. Yes. And so from that point out to the street, it looks like it's gravel yes. out to the pavement. Yes. How wide is that area? 32 feet. 32 by 20. And that's all part of your easement? Yeah. And it's gravel so that we have drainage for the oak trees. Sure, sure. Oh, okay. So, 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 in, essence, in, so in essence, there is no parking for anyone that visits or resides there um, without parking on your easement right. uh, and or blocking your entry Correct. and exit. And the, the issues, 
is the prior owners never tell people park on the street. They never tell people, um, and they'll fit two cars in there, but they don't fit them all the way in, so they're blocking us. And then, you know, people just come in and park there. So it's, you know, it's been 20 years of me being stuck in my own home and not being able to get out because there's cars in my way and I'm tracking people down and you know sometimes they're not even there they've left and the cars are still there and I've called the you know tow trucks to come have them removed and you can't have a tow truck you remove a car off a of private property if it doesn't belong to you so that's not an option okay thank you I'm, I'm surprised to hear that because I just came across somebody, uh, uh, but it was in another jurisdiction where it was possible to remove a property, uh, a car that's been dumped on your property. Right. So they, um, it can be ticketed but not towed. So that still doesn't get me to work. Huh. Um, uh, I'd like to have County Council um, respond to the issues that you uh, raised. You were here for the for the previous hearing, so you know the limitations that the county has to get involved in um, private property disputes. As I said before, <clears throat> excuse me. The the scenario to me sounds extremely unfortunate for you, but it sounds like. Um, an example of uh, a situation where the owner of, of the subject property is 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 violating or has violated their their easement rights by by blocking your access and so I would just repeat what I said before I mean it sounds like it's a it's a, a, a private dispute situation where your, your recourse would be against whoever's blocking your driveway um, for for violating your property rights basically and now, how many violations through the easement would there be until the easement was removed? That's the, an easement is a, a property right, and so that that runs with with this property, and, and it runs with your property. And so that's uh, the the county, us here, we we have no authority to do anything with the easement. It would be um, you could seek recourse by um, g going to court, and you could. I can't advise you of your legal rights, but if, if you're losing salary or, or they're harming you in that way, then you should talk to an attorney about seeking damages from them for, for harming your personal interests. Um, I'm not sure if they'd be recoverable, but that's the kind of thing you should talk to a, a private attorney about to, to, because it would be you enforcing your property rights against your neighbor. Um, and so, the, as I keep saying, it's, it's a, a private matter, okay. and it's not something that we can address here today. Thank you. We are, we are sympathetic, and I, I know the property owner is probably sympathetic, too. He would feel the exact same way. There's nothing like being blocked in to make you feel like a caged animal. So Thank you. I don't know how one would convey it to whoever the eventual owner is. Right, it Mr. Would. Chair, the way I would do it, if, if I were somebody's private attorney in this matter, uh, that would be terms and conditions of the escrow at the sale, <clears throat> that that party would uh, be obligated, and then uh, what other things they would negotiate privately between them at the sale, uh, up to and including any indemnifications that would occur, but again, being a private matter and not being your attorney at this point in time. But that's something, uh, Brian, you know, to ensure that so, you know, the 10-year statute of limitations wouldn't be running against you for non-disclosure? Okay. If I were your attorney. Any other comments or discuss discussion? Yeah, let's close the public hearing. Thank you. Public hearing is closed. Uh, discussion of the commission. Mr. Chair. Mr. Wessner. Um, I'm in agreement with all the findings that staff has made as far as the potential uh, 
variance uh, because it is a unique piece of property and a unique situation. Um, so I'm in favor of gr uh, agreeing with staff recommended actions. Um, I th think uh, Mr. Anthony did present an excellent uh, suggestion for the developer that the carport be the last item phased that properly to minimize the amount of impact on the neighbor. Um, the county doesn't require when that goes up. So the staging, I think, would be a very neighborly thing to do. So with that, I would move the recommended sta stated actions. Second. I just think it's got to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you going to go? No. I just got to think that it's got to be a positive thing to have um, the the property improved, and uh, I would imagine that they're paying a a good amount of money for the property, whoever your eventual neighbors are going to be. And um, uh, I think that uh, when you have a a better piece of property, you know, you get a, another type of of person rather than you know, a rental or something where people um, perhaps are not as neighborly or, or cognizant of, of property rights issues. So hopefully it all goes well for you. Maybe you can get one of your makeup assistants to buy it so you can go in at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if perchance there's a for sale sign out there with a realtor, give them a call. Oh, I will. Okay, why don't I go ahead and vote then. Item passes 4-0. Thank you, staff. Um, thank you, Lori. Um, item 8, uh, moving on with the agenda. Discussion items. Uh, oh, can I back up one second? Uh, we have a, on the previous item, uh, we have a picture that was submitted. Uh, if we could mark that and include it into the file. Okay. Uh, moving on to item 8, uh, discussion, uh, planning director. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. I just have a couple of things about the board's calendar and about um, the Planning Commission's calendar. Um, I know the last time that we talked, the, the decor decision that you made, I let you know what that, that 5-0 decision that, that your Planning Commission made was appealed to the board, and we had set that a couple of different times, and we had moved it again to the second, but we've only just discovered we're not going to have a full board on the second, so we've moved that once again to the 16th. I think it's important on appeal issues that we try to have a full uh, board to hear that because the 2-2 uh, decision is not a decision and not a land use decision. So um, we're going to try to, it's been put on the tentative uh, schedule for the 16th, now December the 16th. And then we had an item on, um, on your agenda for November the 20th where we were going to do the wireless communications and I think that I told you last week that we'd received a new uh, 100 plus page ruling from the FCC that had a lot of ripple effects to that document. So that's in County Council's hand and, and I know Jeff's really busy right now so it's probably a month to let them wade through that document and see what that means to the ordinance that is fully done and ready for hearing. <laughs> And so uh, I don't have a new date for that. And since I don't have a new date for that, I don't see anything else on your tentative agenda right now. So hopefully it will be a slow um, Christmas season because I'm planning on taking six weeks off. So um, uh, my bonding time for well my, little, my little fellow that I adopted a year ago, you know, it just seems the time just gets away from you and it's hard to find a, a six-week block. And so I'm trying then to to do uh, through the slow Christmas holidays. I don't, you know, I'm trying to see no, nothing controversial on your calendar that I'll miss all the excitement for. So hopefully I'll have a nice quiet time off with my little guy and that will be that. So I might not see you again for a while. I don't see anything else on, on your agenda right now, but you know, who knows? Things come up in, a, in an instant that might be put on there. Well, what if we requested an analysis of the water resources issues in the county? Let's not do that. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Forty years of marriage taught me that. <laughs> so I guess we should say Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. Thank you very much, and right back to you. No other comments. Uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>